Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Amy Brand. I'm with Jacobs. Uh, I think you all know me by this point in time. I'm the facilitator for the Stewart Air National Guard Restoration Advisory Board. Welcome, everybody. Appreciate your coming out. We'll go ahead and get started. A couple um, housekeeping things, just a reminder. Please don't walk in the center of the area. I don't want anybody tripping. Okay. Um, for RAB members, when you go to speak, remember that you tap on your microphone and it should turn green. And then you do need to have it fairly close to you, right? Is that right? Yeah, so you need to pull it fairly close to you to speak. Also, when we have somebody online who is going to ask a question, um, there'll just be a slight pause while um, our sound folks make a switch to make it so that we can all hear them. Um, so just bear with us during that period of time. Um, we do have Spanish interpretation, live interpretation here, if anybody um, wants to make use of those services. Um, I think that's all the, the uh, logistics kinds of things I can think of. Um, Johanna, you can go ahead and advance. There you go. Okay, so the agenda you see up here is a slight update from the one that is printed out. Um, what I've done is, um, I think that you did have some times for these subcategories on the agenda. I've tightened those up a little bit because we realized that we did not have 20 minutes allotted to public questions, um, which in, the, um, in our charter, we are supposed to have that. So um, we made an adjustment to make sure that we do. Um, same basic agenda as usual. Um, I also see that I did not change it here. Lieutenant Colonel Tom McGuire, who's our new RAB co-chair, as you know, he had a death in the family and he can't be here tonight. Um, so Lieutenant Colonel Ben Thomas is sitting in for him. You all have met him a number of times before, um, but he'll be, he's here on behalf of Lieutenant Colonel McGuire. Um, we'll be going through updates on environmental projects. Bill will be leading those. Um, along with Walter and Doug. Then we're going to do public questions, and then we'll go to RAB business, okay? Um, next slide. I'm gonna go through the hybrid meeting logistics fairly quickly. Go ahead, Johanna. Um, and again, these are the logistics for everybody here, um, as well as online. At the end of each major presentation, there's a time for RAB members to ask questions. And so we'll we'll go address those questions at the time. Um, you know, I don't necessarily time you on a three minute limit, but we want to try to make sure everybody gets a chance to ask their question um, if if other people are waiting to ask. So please be you know cognizant of that. Um, questions from the public will be addressed again, as I just said later on in the meeting. There's been a little bit of email traffic. You some some of you may have seen that, and we're going to discuss that during the RAB business part of the meeting. And um, so I just wanted you to know that because that's sort of a, just a, a process issue that we'll discuss. If you're here in person, um, just RAB members, raise your hand during the um, you know RAB members ask when they want to in the public. When we get to the public part, please go ahead and raise your your hand. There's a microphone at the back. You don't have to stand at it. You can pick it up and move it around. I may, I may walk it around. Um, for people who are online, I think the Q&A function of WebEx may have gone away in their last update, but we have enabled the chat feature. So, um, Johanna, you can go to the next slide. Um, so, at the bottom, you should be able to see, for folks online, you should be able to see a chat button that you can use for submitting questions or letting us know if there's a problem with the sound. Um, for those online, please do not engage in an online chat because we're trying to monitor that for questions that need to be asked. Um, so it's the same as being here in person, not engaging in, in uh, side conversations. Um, so RAB members, if you're online, raise your hand to be called on to speak. And um, public participants, um, we ask that you type your question in and we'll address those during the public comment part, the public question part of the meeting. Next slide. Um, our RAB members, um, I'm not gonna go through everybody on the list, but um, I have updated these. Uh, as you may recall, we had some discussion about RAB membership last time and some people had not been participating. So this been, has been updated. We still have a vacancy as a government representative from the city of Newburgh, and um, I know Mr. Lawson has reached out to them, and um, I, I haven't heard that we have an update on that yet, so. Um, Victoria Lung is gonna be sitting in for 
um, Dan tonight, who I think is away, and she's indicated she'd probably be online. I don't know if she is for sure yet, but um, I'm okay, on next the line. phone. If you can hear me. And from the National Guard Bureau, um, Lieutenant Colonel DeFeo and Keith Freihofer, I think, are both online. And we have um, Bill Meyer, who you all know, is a, um, the remedial project manager. Um, and from the base, again, we have Lieutenant Colonel Ben Thomas sitting in for um, Lieutenant Colonel McGuire. And Mike Ottinger is here as well. Um, and I'm, again, I'm not going to go through everybody. I know that Justin is also not available to be here tonight and indicated that he would have um, another representative from the DEC here. Okay, he's raising his hand. Kyle, or Ryan, Ryan. So Ryan's here um, from the DEC uh, because Justin was not able to be here. Next slide. I'm going a little quickly because I see a lot of familiar faces and you've all seen these slides before and hopefully they're not entirely new to the folks online either. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to the co-chairs. Again, we have a co-chair from the base and one from the community, um, Lieutenant Colonel Ben Thomas. Go ahead, sir. All right. Um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ben Thomas, I'm the base civil engineer at Stewart Air National Guard Base. I report directly to Lieutenant Colonel uh, um, Tommy McGuire, who, who sends his regrets, uh, but understandably uh, couldn't be with us tonight. Um, uh, I participated in this at least as a, as a wallflower uh, several times and, and as, as acting co-chair, so, uh, so I, I, uh, I feel like we have a rapport. Um, uh, as Amy uh, mentioned briefly, we, we did have a, a member of the public uh, express a, 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 a desire um, to move up public comments. Um, uh, Mr. Lawson and Colonel McGuire discussed it and decided to leave the agenda in the format that it is here and to bring that up in RAB business for the board uh, to, 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 to discuss and to, and to come to a, a conclusion on uh, rather, than, rather than changing the format uh, before the meeting uh, or without the consent of the rest of the board. So, um, so that's, that's the reason for the agenda as it, as it is now. Uh, looking forward to uh, an open discourse and, uh, and a great update uh, from Bill Meyer on, uh, on our critical process um, uh, it? Analysis. analysis, critical process analysis. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I got I got to preview the slides, so there's 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 some good stuff there, and I'm looking forward to that discussion. Uh, Ed, over to you. Thank you. Um, Ed, I think the only thing I would add is that we are excited to make sure that the public has an opportunity to participate, and we've discussed some various ways that that could happen. But for the, the closeness in the meeting today. We just felt it was appropriate for us to come and discuss what could happen. I, I know that I've made the suggestion that maybe they can write in questions so that we can address them as we're presenting or as members of the uh, saying present, they can see these questions and, and then incorporate their responses um, to these questions. Uh, maybe someone like Amy could shuffle through and get that because it is really important that the public feel heard and that they, uh, the issues that and concerns that are, that are meaningful to them are addressed. I think it speaks to the openness of that, allows people to want to participate because they feel like their voice will be heard. So I think it's important for us to consider. I know we're gonna do that later in RAB business. So I would encourage anybody that has any questions from the public to share them. I don't know the process, you just described it, Amy. But um, I really appreciate the opportunity for us to have this open dialogue. I, and like anything, it takes time to work through kinks. I appreciate the ability for us to be able to communicate in between um, meetings. Still need to work a little bit harder at getting the um, agenda out, but um, excited to hear about the updates and look forward to the continued conversation. Um, someone mentioned from the public too um, about the upcoming October 25th poster meeting. I want to make sure that we reserve some time in RAB business to discuss how we might perfect that. And maybe it's again in between meetings to talk about what we could do differently to make sure that that, that, that works out well. So thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Lawson. The poster board session is on the agenda during the RAB business section. Um, how in depth we get to discuss that will depend on where we are on time at that point in the meeting. And, and yeah, of course we can, can continue those conversations between meetings. But we do have that to address, um, at least initially, 
at tonight's meeting. Okay, with that, then we will move on. Um, Vance, Johanna, you're going backwards. No, that's forward. We're moving on to Bill Meyer, who will provide us with updates on the environmental projects. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Bill Meyer, Restoration Program Manager for Stewart. Tonight, I'm going to give you a quick update on the New York State DOT 17K project. Steward a critical process analysis where we're at with that and then also the Air Force PFAS fingerprint and background studies. So first we're going to start out with the CPA. So if you can move to the next slide. Okay, so Nobilis finished their uh, CPA phase one report. I actually just got it about a, a week ago. I got the signed stuff so I can release that. It's going to be a public document. Um, basically, it provides all the details of what they identified, you know, for the potential interim actions and other data gaps and all this other stuff. So we got the overview back in April, right? They came in and gave the overview. So this is the phase one report that provides all the details of what they recommended and what they found and what they thought were recommended interim actions. And part of that, you know, one of the recommended ones was to do two stormwater outfall repairs that go into Rec Pond. And then the other part was on the southern boundary by upgrading from Rec Pond, doing some type of uh, groundwater action to hydraulically control the, the contaminants that are groundwater contamination that's migrating into the pond. So a combination of storm sewer is one interim action. The other one is uh, hydraulic you know, groundwater doing like a trench out there to intercept groundwater flowing into Rec Pond. Knowing that we're only dealing with the overburden, but a lot of that, you know, from the surface down to the bedrocks is what we're going to address because we're still working on the RI to address, you know, what's in bedrock and that. So that's uh, that report's done. And also, I got a draft of the phase two CPA that they're working on. I just got that two days ago. So we're looking at that. We're going to be providing comments on that. And what that does, it provides more detail on the scope what's required to execute, plus some rough order magnitude costs. Third bullet, I've got independent government cost estimates to support me programming these actions for FY25. So I'm putting in the requirements as a, it's a new requirement because I couldn't program anything until I had an independent government cost estimate that says, here's what I want to program. So now I've got that, here's what I want to program, so on my side of it, I have to submit uh, what's just called a program action or yeah, program action, a PAR, program administrative requirement, basically saying, hey, I've got a new requirement. It's not funded because the Air Force doesn't even know about it yet because I haven't submitted it. So next week, next couple of weeks, I'm going to be submitting these programming documents to actually capture what the, the cost is for these. And because of the timing, you know, we're, we're in July right now, the end of the fiscal year is uh, 30 September. We're, we're not gonna be able to do any contracting action, you know, before September, just because it takes, you know, X amount of time and I haven't even submitted what the requirement was. So, so we're looking at probably FY25, I'll have the requirement in there and then it'll get prioritized, you know, with the Air Forces, all the other priorities. So, you know, nothing's guaranteed, but, you know, I'm going to submit the requirement and then we'll have that discussion, you know, with AFCAC and see how it prioritizes. So those, that's what's going on with that. If you go to the next slide, just for folks, if you weren't here in April, this is just kind of an overview of what the CPA was, what it talked about. We're basically, it was a, you know, Air Force uh, CZTE, that's the technical group with AFCAC. They contracted with Noblis, which was a third party contractor, and they looked at all of our data. So I went down to San Antonio in April, <clears throat> and I was working with AECOM, trying to give them all the analytical data, all the stuff that they needed to do this independent evaluation. So it's not just uh, Bill Meyer making the recommendation, it's the Air Force technical group and their contractor looking at it and coming up with recommendations. So what that does for us though, that allows in the past, if you didn't have like the CPA or those recommendations like that, they would uh, ask me, well, Bill, what's, 
what's this $10 million requirement to do X? What's the details of it? You know, they don't, they don't know what they don't know. That all I see is a number to do, you know, an action. So now I've got CPA phase one and I'll have CPA phase two coming up here in the near term, but I'll have supporting documentation that the resource managers aren't gonna have to look at that because it's already been looked at by a third party through their technical group. So I've already kind of checked the block on that. It's just a matter of getting a, you know, the funding prioritized, you know, to execute that. So, so that's it for uh, CPA. If any questions on CPA, I just go through all of them and I'll take questions and that'll be easier. No, that's okay. All right, so next, uh, background, PFAS fingerprinting and background. So UFP QAMP was submitted from AFCAC to the regulators, DEC got the, a copy of the, uh, the uh, basically it's the addendum to the programmatic QAP. And then they also received uh, the programmatic QAP which was for the seven installations across the nation that they're doing the study at. The addendum was the specific for Stewart, what they were gonna do for soil, groundwater and surface water. So ten, um, tentatively, they're scheduled, they're gonna work with AECOM to come out in the fall when they're doing some sampling or sometime they're gonna work to coordinate to integrate so they can jointly you know, collect samples. Um, DEC is gonna provide comments. I talked to uh, Justin Starr. He's gonna try to shoot for one August to have comments on that back to AFCAC. And then they're doing a separate meeting with um, DEC there was a redacted uh, version of the programmatic QAP because they're working with a company called Battelle and there's proprietary information on there that wasn't releasable. I, anyway, they're, they're gonna meet with DEC to explain what was redacted in the, in the QAP. So they didn't want, they couldn't release it to the public unredacted. And DEC is getting a, I think it's the, second week or first week of August, they're getting that briefing. So AFCAC is gonna to talk to DEC directly. Uh, I know it's Justin Starr and I think there's two or three other folks from DEC that are interested in it and will be involved. So on to the next, the 17K update. I don't have a slide on this, but basically DOT came out uh, middle of June to to look at RecPON and some other recommendations related to the 17K bypass. So remember we were gonna, they were supposed to brief in April, but two of the courses of action that they had had some issues with it. And so they actually went out and they're looking at a couple other courses of action right now. So once they get, they've already done the field work to do that. Now they need to come back and tell us, you know, what the, the course of action is recommended. So, and then we'll do the, they'll, they'll brief the RAB, you know, once, once they come up with that. So I, I, timeline and all that, that's up to, that's in DOT's lane, but I'm not gonna speak on their behalf. Just know that they're working on, looking at a couple other courses of action for the 17K diversion, in addition to what they already looked at, because they had two COAs identified. And so that's what I have for the 17K. On to the questions. Okay, questions from RAB members about those three discussions. I, I know there was a an email um, from Heather Pillsworth at the um, at the DOT, and I think that was forwarded to all the RAB members. Is that correct? Okay, that came out today. Um, I, I received it, and, and I did forward it to the RAB members. I don't think it was sent directly to the RAB members. Thank you, Mr. Lawson. I appreciate that. He he said that he, I think it was sent directly to Dan Shapley because that's who she's been coordinating with and Dan is out. So Mr. Lawson um, forwarded that to. Yeah, she sent it to both. And, uh, okay, great. And he, so Mr. Lawson forwarded that to RAB members. So if you haven't seen it yet today, it should be in your email. Questions for Bill? Chuck Thomas is, go ahead. Try to get my microphone. Going. Oh, just a reminder. I, I obviously uh, did say who he is, but for the sake of the record, please um, say who you are before you ask your question. Okay, Chuck Thomas. Uh, Bill, you covered a lot of territory, kind of quickly, but that's, well, that's okay. Good. I'm glad we're moving along. A uh, couple of questions. Was the um, two priority projects, was that the uh, 
the critical, the CPA and the PFAS studies, the fingerprinting, are those the two that are going to be prioritized? No, the uh, interim actions, the stormwater to outfall repair, and uh -huh. then the groundwater um, basically controlling the uh, groundwater contamination that's migrating, flowing towards Rec Pond. We're going to put up a, uh, we're looking at doing a trench, doing a pilot test study to see, and then doing a trench for the interim action. So combination. Okay, so those are need to be, they have been prioritized or you're submitting? Not yet, I haven't priority. submitted it yet. I just got the, okay. I just got the well, data that I need to submit the requirement. I think where they're gonna be submitted. So when's that submission? When do we, do we know when it's going in or when you might hear something? I, yeah, I gotta submit it. And then right now they're programming for FY25. So this will be put into the, right. The pile of projects that goes for FY25. Some are already been identified because we do a, it's called PRD, Program Requirement Development. We already started for FY25. We started that back in December. So this is going to be a new requirement that'll be added to that. And then the documentation that I'm submitting, they're going to look at it and they'll include it in that prioritization when they develop it. Thank you. Yep. Bill, I'll, I'll, I'll just add to that. So the, the scope of these projects put them well over the MILCON level. So, sorry, MILCON is a colloquial term DOD guys use for MILCON. So th these are large projects, right? They're, they're gonna be they're gonna be at the MILCON level, military construction level, which is usually line item by line item approved by Congress and is a five year development cycle. And I'm not talking about five years to construct, I'm talking about five years from idea to requirement to programming to design and then submitting for for construction so this timeline that that bill is bill is 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 is, is talking about is extremely accelerated for from a federal government perspective i know that's rather unsatisfying from a general public standpoint but as you know, speaking as a guy who's who's spent my entire career working construction in the military it's extremely accelerated john clark here so if i may correct me if i'm wrong I think Bill just went through a long description about um, the contracting process with requirements and, and getting it in front of the fiscal year 25. I, I think you were talking about these two priority, yeah. is, these two priority projects. So if that makes it more clear, um, all of that, <laughs> I, I recognize while you were going that there's a lot of federal like Jargon. contracting language in that explanation, but it's those two things he, he's trying to, he was trying to lay out his actions for those two things. What I need to do yeah, yeah. to get it programmed, basically. So if I don't do anything, it doesn't get programmed. Give on the RPM. <laughs> Can I turn this on again? Oh, it's on, thank you. Hey, Mike Shade. Uh, so just to clarify, you mentioned the phase one CPA report, it's awaiting signature and uh, the contractor has started phase two in terms of figuring out more detail on the scope. Yep. So will we have an opportunity to review and provide input comment on either of those or at a minimum to actually see them? You can see them. I'm going to release the CPA phase one report that basically outlines, you know, okay. Noblest put together in, and, and the technical APCAC technical group signed off on. Mm. And do you have a sense of when I might have missed that? You went pretty as soon quick. as I can get it out to Amy and she can send it out okay. to y'all. I mean, I just literally got it like a, a week ago, so I we'll get it out. Great, thank you. So given the, you know, what uh, the Colonel was saying about the timeline, you know, these projects take very long is, you know, you're thinking about these pretend, potential IRMs, you know, needing to get approved for funding, et cetera, you know, doing studies on what is the scope you know, what is your best guess at this point in terms of when some of these could potentially break ground? So having the independent government cost estimate, you need to develop a performance work statement, but I have what I need to get the, you know, the money programmed. Can't do contracting unless I got the money programmed and approved. So the next step, you know, in the next month or two, AFCAC will have this requirement. They're already developing what the FY25, they're, they call it like a spend plan. What are we gonna do on FY25? How many RIs are we gonna do? How many interim actions? How many, you know, they, they got all these different things and PFAS isn't the only thing in there. There's other restoration stuff, mm -hmm. you know, traditional. 
outside of you know emerging contaminants. So all that gets looked at, and then they put it in a, a program and a spend plan, and then they prioritize that. So I, I'll know once that gets integrated. They they don't even know what the dollar amount is because I haven't told them yet. So that's what I'm going to do next week. Is put those documentation, put the program administrative requirement in that identifies here's the cost for these two actions. The CPA is going to be a supporting document for that, so that everyone's going to know. Oh yeah, this was a CPA project, and and then the core IGEs are going to be part of that, and then that'll support and justify, you know, what the dollar amount is. John, yeah. yeah, John Clark. Um, yeah. So, so <laughs> like, maybe you can cut, so he talked about getting into fiscal year twenty five funds. Does that mean that they could break ground in twenty five, or that means they start designing? They can, they can start if it's chosen. Big caveat. They right? got to award a contract before they can do anything. Right. So it's going to take part of the year of twenty five, depending on when the money and, and Congress plays a role in this right. when they approve the National Defense Authorization Act for FY twenty five. That hasn't been approved yet. So yeah. one day, right, we, we understand that, but yeah. just if it gets chosen, if if you get your requirements in and, and all of your wickets, if it gets chosen, what's the earliest, you know, what? They'll start working on it. Yeah. So if the contract was awarded, like in, let's say, if they awarded it in June, you know, the contractor, just like AECOM, they had to put together their program management plan. They got a schedule. Then they got the, the work plan that comes up on how they're going to do it, all these things. So we got to go through all this process. Is that a year? But yeah, it probably. Three years? Oh, yeah. Eh, probably a year or less. Just so because 20, 20, 26, maybe. Great. Depends on how quick they, they go about it. I can't tell. 20, yeah. Okay. I mean, look at AECOM. Let's look at, you know, they, they put together a program, UFP QAP, and it took some time, and they had to program it. Did it happen quicker than that? It can always happen quicker than that. It depends on what they propose and what the government accepts as, you know, that's part of the, the contract. You know, they got to propose, they put together a schedule and a budget. So, so are you saying it can it happen in two months? No, it's not going to happen in two months. We got to do the administrative planning documents just like we did for the RI. Actual something that's operational. Yeah. I mean, it's going to take some time, and there's some other data collection that we got to do to support that. So I think what we're all hearing is that there's a process. It's a government process. It's not as quick as anybody wants, um, but it is an accelerated process. Um, I believe that Victoria Lung has a question online, so bear with us while the sound guys flip the switch. Hi, has it been switched yet? We can hear you. Okay, awesome. So, um, so a few quick things on the fingerprinting study. This is something we've asked for um, before. We would like to see the co-op. Um, that's possible, and also if we could attend um, the briefing that was discussed, that would be really helpful. I understand there could be like different security issues, but we would be very interested in attending if we could. Okay. Okay. Am I clear, hot? So, yes, I can do you a couple things. I can get you when Justin Starr sends out his comments. I mean, he's got the, a copy of the UFP QAP. I can send that out as well. It's the addendum. So, you can get his comments and the UFP QAP addendum. Send that out. Not an issue. Attending the meeting in that, you know, that's I don't know the DEC often invites you know the public to attend meetings with them, but that's something that you would have to work out with the uh, DEC because it's a meeting for them, not necessarily for the RAB. So, but we'll pass that on to Justin Starr and. That's all I can do on that aspect. I don't. I don't think it's a security question. It's more of a because it's a proprietary information and that, and working with the regulators, there's some yeah client, right. contractor confidentiality with the data that they've got. So, but Justin, if you can attend the meeting, Justin will be able to tell you what he saw and heard at the meeting. I gotta imagine he 
wouldn't have any issues with that. They're not going to make them sign a and non-disclosure agreement. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello. Yes. Um, my name is Ryan Richard. I'm with the New York State DEC uh, here um, attending on behalf of Justin Starr. So I just want to know who who uh, asked the question, if you, if you don't mind. I can bring the uh, question back to Justin online. That's Victoria Lung, L-E-U-N-G. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take Jennifer's question and then we're going to move on to the next presentation. Jennifer Rollinson. Okay, so you already introduced me. Um, so back to the CPA, there Mike had asked, you know, what role and in, in engagement we the RAB can have in in that, um, and also if there is, um, what's the the thirty day comment period? What's the timeline for all of that? Yeah, that's something different. So there's two things here. CPA one's already done. Um, the CPA two, they're working on, but that's just more details of the perform, you know, how to execute and some rough order magnitude costs and the core will use those to kind of up plus or minus up their, you know, independent government cost estimate because well, anyway, so there's a 30 day public comment period. So when we do, uh, so once I get this programmed. The next, another thing that I have to do, it's called a non time critical removal action. Engineering evaluation cost analysis. We call it NTICRA ECA. <laughs> I'm trying not to speak in jargon, but basically that outlines here's the two different things that we're looking at, and they look at costs related to it. So there's a cost analysis, and then they look at other alternatives. Is there something else that you could do in lieu of maybe a trench or maybe in lieu of stormwater repair? And most likely there's not going to be too many other alternatives. I mean, other than there's maybe three or four, three different ways to repair a stormwater line, you know, what's the best, but they'll look at all those things. And then what it does is it comes up with a recommended, you know, and that's a circular process. So it's just the way we document it. They do this NTICRA, ECA, goes out for a 30 day public comment period. And then people comment on it and then we take those comments and then we do an action memorandum that documents the decision. So that uh, that all goes on while we're waiting, you know, right. to I, that before. I'm, I'm sorry, because you keep press, pushing us about we might not have time to conclude our business later. So I just want okay. to, I asked specifically, what is the timeline? When will we know? When when is that happening so that we can engage well, in that? that no, sure. Yeah, as soon as I do the programming in that, I will, uh, I can, uh, you know, I want to kind of get a kind of a north south head shake from. AFCAC that I got money programmed because I don't want to do the NTICRA ECA if I don't have funding. So as soon as they tell me that I got funding, which I said it might be a month or two, you know, because they're working on prioritizing all this, um, I'll be able to uh, basically, uh, what's my train of thought here? So okay. NTICRA, I can start that with a contractor we work with you know, this fall. So they can start developing that NTICRA ECA this fall, but I want to make sure that I got the funding approved because I don't want to do something for is it still not answered? that I don't have money for. Okay, I, I, I appreciate all the process, but my question is more about when, like how will we be notified for that 30 day comment period so that we can be engaged in whatever needs to be done? Oh yeah, we do a that, public that's note. That's question. Oh yeah, yeah. okay. It's pretty broad, but we can, we'll do the advertising just like we do for like the CIP. We advertise that and said, there's 30 day public comment period. You're going to know that I'm starting it before it even goes out for the public comment period. So, so all, all RAB members will receive yeah. an email. Oh, sure. Vacation. Definitely. Okay. Because people go on yeah. vacation. We want to make sure if someone, nope. one person doesn't get it, everybody doesn't get it. No, we're not going to slide this in by the, you know, in the background in the night, we're going to. You'll get notified that there's a 30 day public comment period for draft final and, you know, regulators and health department, they review it. They, they do the draft final before we even release it. So you're going to know that it's coming well in advance. Thank you. Thanks. Absolutely. We will make sure that goes out to everybody. Um, we're going to move on to the next presentation. 
this topic was supposed to be on all three. Okay, this will be the last question for now because we're never going to get through our, our agenda. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, because we got this long email, not a long, but we got an email about 17K, which we haven't really discussed at all. Uh, so the question is, it said there was a issue with, or not an issue, but it kind of the email suggested that the stormwater retention system would cost about $30 million and they're considering other alternatives. So does that mean, given that they're considering other alternatives, does that mean that the stormwater containment system they were considering is just off the table now or? No, it's not. They've got to look. I got to see what they come up with their analysis for these other courses of action. Okay. Because so, by the by the way that that's written, it kind of suggests that it is off the table. No, yeah. they haven't done the final selection of a course of action. So until they actually they went out in the field to collect the data, now they got to come back and tell us the pros and cons of what these other courses of action are compared to what they already had on the table. So they already had selected two, and then they came up with some issues with it. 100 year floodplain and some other things. So now they got to look at these other alternatives and they gotta, they're they going to relook at them and then they're going to come back to us saying, we think this because of this. Okay. And I don't know what the details of all of it is. Yeah. That's a DOT thing. But when they do, we'll, we'll know. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Sorry. Mike. No, and, and for follow on questions on 17K, I encourage you to respond to Heather because it's not part of the environmental restoration program directly. Um, so with that, we're going to move on to the um, updates on the remedial investigation, and which is again Bill and then um, Walt Howard from AECOM. I get to talk. All right, next slide, please. So this, I always like to start out with this conceptual site model, and one thing I want to note for y'all on this. So when you look at this on the slides, and then also in the room. You know, we've got these question marks. So the second mobilization that we're doing, we're trying to come up with answers for where these question marks are. You know, for like PFAS, how far does it go down gradient? What's upgrading from the site? So all these step out things that we're doing, uh, sampling for groundwater, soil, surface water, sediment, all these things are additional information that we need to do to close the loop on these question marks that we have on the conceptual site model. So we know in general, you know, how things work out here. You know, there was a PFAS release and now we, th we think it's getting into the stormwater through groundwater infiltration into the stormwater piping. And then it's also flowing into rec pond. So now we're trying to do that basically lateral and vertical delineation of that and kind of confirm. So one of the questions is, you know, bedrock, has it gone to bedrock yet? You know, we don't know. We've got a couple of bedrock wells and had some low level detects, but we don't have a really good picture. Same with, you know, around each area concern, you know, the lateral and vertical extent of delineate, you know, for groundwater, soil, are there some hot spot soil source areas? I mean, we're working towards that, but basically everything that we're doing in this RI, you know, the second mobilization is basically all the step outs and Walt's gonna talk to you about where we're at on that. If you can go on to the next slide. Okay. So this is kind of just a general update. We did the draft addendum. I think do we got we're getting ready to do the final to it, right? With DEC, right. So we sat down with DEC and the health department. We went over their comments and that and got everything resolved. And basically we went over the MOB2 locations and what we're doing for the investigation. We talked about adding, you know, the additional areas of interest. And the 1633. So anyway, we've moved out there and I'm going to hand it off to Walt because I don't want to steal all of the thunder. He came all the way down here to tell you all the good things he's doing. Thanks, Bill. Hello. Um, Hi, I'm Walt Howard with AECOM, uh, project manager for the PFSRI. So, yeah, as Bill spoke, I mean, this is a kind of, uh, you know, background. It's a uh, similar slide from uh, April, just, uh, you know, the CLAP, our UFP CLAP addendum for mobilization two um, that went into DEC uh, in late April. And we went, actually, it was the last RAB meeting. We went, we met with DEC, went through it all. They had comments. We've addressed them. Uh, 
We're still waiting to finalize, actually technically finalize it, the QAP addendum um, with some revisions uh, that'll get incorporated once we finalize uh, some of our, our right of entries that we're working on. Uh, but we began the um, mobilization to the field work. DEC gave us approval to start. We started in uh, mid-May. Um, and uh, so now the next few slides has figures and I'll just kind of give you an overview of what our scope of the uh, mobilization two is and, and where we're at with it. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, so this first figure is, you know, all the dots on this represent all of the sampling points uh, that we have in mobilization two. Um, there's a 139 soil borings. Uh, we have a table down at the lower right hand corner that has all of the locations and, and what we have completed. We have 139 soil borings, we have 58 uh, temporary monitoring wells, uh, and then we have five new bed, uh, permanent bedrock wells, and then we'll be doing, um, let's see, 60, we have 64 uh, surface water sample locations. Some of those will also have uh, uh, co-located sediment and pore water samples, um, and then we'll have another round of, of stormwater sampling. Um, so the, the green dots on this figure, they represent the locations that we've completed. The purple ones are those that were, remain to be completed. Um, they're, you know, the uh, lion's share, the ones that are all over the map, they're, you know, the, the ones that are all spread out, they're surface water locations. Um, we haven't begun any of the surface water sampling yet or um, or the stormwater sampling. Um, we've completed 35 soil borings. Uh, we've installed 17 of the uh, temporary monitoring wells. And um, yeah, so that said, I guess we can go to the next slide. Uh, this next figure, this is a, a map of our soil borings, just our soil borings for mobilization two. Uh, again, the green dots are locations that have been completed. Um, and the purple dots are yet to be completed. Uh, there, you know, since this map was put together, we have an additional 10 to 15 soil borings that we've completed that, that don't show up on this map. So there's, there's a few more completed than what, than what it shows here. Um, for the most part, all of these locations are, you know, most of them are, are offset locations from mobilization one samples where we had exceedances. So, you know, most of those on the base area, uh, they're basically just stepping out to define the limits of impact that were detected in mobilization one samples. Um, then in addition to that, we have, uh, you can see a couple clusters, one way off to the west side of the, of the base and then one at the northeast corner of the base. Uh, those are new uh, uh, re potential release areas or areas of concern uh, that weren't, we weren't looking at in mobilization one, but they've been added to our scope. Uh, to the west, that's uh, a former satellite firehouse that the base used. Um, also, we call it building 142. So we have a, a bunch of borings over there to evaluate soil quality. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, and then up to the northeast, up to the northeast, that's uh, a former nozzle testing area. Um, that area had been investigated back in slight, somewhat back in the site investigation period. Uh, now, because of the lower screening level, EPA screening levels, concentrations that were detected there in 2016, 2017 were, were not considered exceedances, but with the lower screening levels, they are now. So we're going back there, we're going to do additional, additional soil borings there. And then based on those results, put in additional groundwater sampling points. Um, okay, I guess, yeah, we can, we can go on from there. Thank you. Uh, so this figure represents all of our uh, te temporary monitoring wells that are installed in, uh, for sampling groundwater in the overburden. Um, this shows, uh, so all the red locations on here, those are all of our mobilization one lo locations. We've already installed and sampled all those. Um, I just wanted to show them there, put them on here for reference. The other dots, the, again, the green ones, those are mobilization two locations that are completed, and the purple dots are mobilization two locations that are still remain to be completed. Um, so in addition, on this figure, uh, you'll see the blue lines here. So all those blue lines, those represent 
the groundwater contaminant plume. Um, and that's, you know, this information was presented at the RAB meeting back in January initially. Um, so those lines, they, they represent uh, the concentration of, they basically represent the, the distribution of PFOS, that's PFOS uh, contamination in the overburdened groundwater. And those lines, they, they connect points of equal ice of concentration in the groundwater. Uh, the range in the concentrations is between, you know, less than four parts per trillion, and that's mainly to the northeast side of the base, um, to a high of over 4,000 parts per trillion, and that is all concentrated down at the southwest portion of the base uh, in the vicinity of the former uh, firehouse or AOC3, and then down there um, between the retention basins and rec pond. And so that's, you know, that area of, of impacted groundwater, that's what Bill was talking about. One, one portion of the CPA is, is, you know, addressing that groundwater impact that is there between uh, the retention basins and rec pond. Um, okay, I, we can go to the next slide. Um, so this is our mobilization two uh, surface water sample location map, and um, you can see that there's, you know, it's a pretty large map. It extends quite a quite a big distance. Um, so all the red triangles on there, those are mobilization one surface water sample locations that we are going to resample in mobilization two. Uh, the purple dot or triangles there, those are also mobilization one samples. Um, but we are not going to resample those locations. Um, we don't have a need for additional data at those points. Um, and instead of that, we've added uh, 17 more new locations for mobilization uh, to, to evaluate further distant downstream along all the drainage uh, basins. Um, and those are represented by the, uh, the green and the yellow triangles. So the green ones you can see down, down there. Uh, out along Wasaic Creek, and then uh, down to the southeast, further down Silver Stream, uh, more to the east there, Bill, just to the east of the throughway. We have a couple points there, and then down into Moodna Creek. Yeah. So we'll, we're going to sample all the way down, uh, down into Moodna Creek. Uh, um, so, like, you know, we're waiting, you know, until, you know, once we get all of our right of entry, um, agreements finalized and executed will begin the surface water sampling. So, okay, um, we can go on. Next slide, please. All right, so this is our stormwater sampling map, and um, there's 57 locations here. Uh, with the exception of a couple points, all these are the same locations that we sampled in mobilization one. Uh, we need to duplicate our sampling, at least, collect at least two samples from those locations. Um, so once we, again, we have a couple of right of entry uh, things that are coming up uh, that we need to, to get tied up and then we'll be doing the stormwater sampling. Um, and that, you know, that'll take, you know, a few days to a week to complete. So that, that'll go quickly. Um, and I guess we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so this slide is, uh, it's pretty much the same figure that I showed you early, you know, previously on the, um, temporary groundwater wells in the blue um, plume map. Uh, this figure has all of our uh, temporary groundwater sampling points or mo temporary monitoring wells. Um, it also has the mobilization monitoring wells and it has the, the plume map, which here is in yellow. Um, it's the same, but it's the same contour lines that there are in that, that previous map. Um, the di only difference with this figure is uh, the mobilization one locations, uh, each one of those symbols are shaded either red or green uh, uh, to depict where uh, a mob you know, the mobilization one sample exceeded the screening level for PFOS. Uh, so they're shaded either red or green, the green ones didn't, didn't exceed. So um, not a lot of difference here with this, that's pretty much the only difference here with that previous map. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, 
you know, mobilization one, our, our samples were pretty much concentrated around the base. And we have exceedances there. In mobilization two, we are still doing step outs for all those exceedances, some, you know, looking at, you know, immediately down gradient from those locations to see how far uh, the contaminant plume extends, you know, in each one of those areas. But then in addition to that, we're taking the, you know, a broader step out away from the base further because, you know, I mean, the PFOS, the screening levels are so low, it's, you know, very, you know, it's, it, you know, many of the locations have exceedances. So if we want to try to fully delineate uh, to the screening levels, we need to step further back, you know, and that's what we're obligated to do is to, you know, define the limits, you know, in accordance with what the, you know, regulatory screening levels are. So we're taking a further step back and we're doing further, you know, perimeter, perimeter samples. Uh, then we have some additional ones over in here, which are, you know, this is to evaluate groundwater quality in the vicinity of building 142 or the um, satellite uh, fire firehouse, the former satellite firehouse. Um, yeah, so, you know, we have, we have further step outs here now to the east and south rec pond. Um, we're also going to be sampling uh, some pre-existing wells further down in the uh, Silver Stream drainage basin um, associated with EPA investigation of another site at the airport. Um, so uh, I guess we can go to the, the next slide. So this is our just an update on our RI schedule. Um, so again, mobilization one was completed in 2023. Uh, our RI, our you know mobilization two, um, we had had a plan for you know finishing up in the summer. This summer, uh, we have experienced some field delays, um, and so that's going to push us back and completing mode two probably into the fall. We you know sometime this fall. Um, and then because of that, we're pushing back uh, mobilization three and four uh, one season to complete those. Uh, so, but overall, you know, the delay right now, we don't see that the delays are going to, um, you know, prevent us from completing the project is originally scheduled uh, in 2026. So, okay. sure. Okay, can you go back one slide, please? To the step outs for the groundwater. There you go. So these step outs, once they get done with these step outs, when we do the next mobilization, that's when we're going to put in the permanent monitoring wells. Doing these temporary groundwater samples helps us not spend a lot of money putting in permanent things and it helps us delineate the footprint before we actually install the permanent wells. So once we get those, the data back from all these step out locations, when we come out for the third mobilization, they'll be installing monitoring wells, right? Correct? Okay. Just so you know, uh, so that's, and then hopefully we're done with step outs or if we do some step outs, it's just some minor ones related to building 142 and then this PRL 16 over here, because they're like one phase behind. We added those after we started the first you know, the field event as additional sites. So they're just a little bit behind, but I'm sure during the third mobilization, if there's step outs required for that, we'll do those and then install wells, but that's it. Okay. And I think, um, I think we got through Walt's last slide. So we'll go to next one. I think is questions. Yeah. Okay. So questions from RAB members, please. Go ahead, Mr. Bowen. Thanks. Thanks. One there. There. Thanks for this. Um, can we go back to the schematic way back? With, with Conceptual the, site model. I, I just wonder: is it premature to sketch in where the trench would be on this? Uh, no, this is Bill Meyer. So if you go to the the ISO concentration map. This, this is fine. We can come back to this, but if you, the one with the blue, the ISO concentrations. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right here. So all these wells in here, I mean, we got like a 
concentration of what is it 50,000 parts per trillion in a groundwater sample or well? 20,000 in here. We know, and what we can tell, I mean, if you look at the shape of these blooms, this doesn't tell you which way groundwater is flowing, but you can see how they're elongated. And it, once we put it in the monitoring wells and we get the groundwater elevation data, it's likely it's going to show groundwater flowing this way to the southeast. Towards. So, and we know that we've got groundwater samples in here. They're, they're probably the highest ones that we have on the base at the southern boundary. So for us to do a groundwater in its interim, it's not the final solution. It's something to stop that contaminated groundwater from migrating into rec pond. So that, that's one piece. Rec pond, you know, discharges and goes off into Silver Spring. So if we can prevent that, you know, remove that mass from going into the pond and then fix the two outfalls that are discharging into it that, you know, they did Nobles looked at them and they had some significant levels of groundwater infiltrate, contaminated groundwater infiltrating those stormwater lines. If we can prevent those two things, we're reducing the contaminant loading into rec pond, which will help, you know, we got the surface water treatment going on. That coupled with the 17K diversion, if they do that, I think a lot of those things will help reduce what's going into rec pond. And that's the idea of the interim action to, to take some quick strike. You know, we, we were, we were talking, you know, with DEC about this, I think probably about three weeks ago, you know, they wanted to know, you know, there's other areas of the base. I said, well, everything can't be a priority. I mean, we're trying to, but we're trying to focus on the worst first, you know, and these two areas seem to be that, and that's why we did that. CPA and Noblest recommended, you know, these to do that. So does that answer your question? Yeah, so it, uh, you go back to the schematic? This, this conceptual site model, yep. So I just, it, you know, in the schematic, there's a, there, there's yep. a line between green and gray. So basically kind of like. This is groundwater here, everything below this. And so this is uh, soil. And then this is where the weathered bedrock starts. So we know we, with the, the temporary groundwater wells, they did a vertical aquifer profiling. So they collected it at, at the water table, which is about 10 feet ish, depending on where you're at, elevation dictated, but 10 feet down anywhere, bedrocks like anywhere down to 50 feet, right? Or more, depending on, you know, how the surface undulates, the bedrock surface. So, so there, you know, there's a vertical component to this and we've got vertical contamination at depth that we've measured. We know right now, you know, that trench would go down to the, probably to the bedrock you know, the top of that weathered zone just to capture that to make sure. You know, the RI, if it's if it actually ends up being in bedrock, that's a whole nother solution set to deal with bedrock contamination. But right now we're just dealing with what what we know. I mean I can't I mean I, that's all I have is the data to work with what we know. And I think we got enough to do do that. And it's as evident by the phase two or phase one report, you'll see, you know, Noblis and uh, the technical group, they support that, those recommendations. The trench, yeah, it parallels Rec Pond. It goes from west to east in between the lagoons and then, you know, try to capture as much of those high concentrations that we see. Okay. But there's gonna be, they're gonna do a pump test to evaluate hydraulic conductivity in the soil, you know, how permeable the soil is and how fast groundwater flows through it. We need all those things. So when they do the actual trench, I mean, they'll do, there's a little design work that goes into it, but that, that's what we're hoping to do is to be able to capture that in that unsaturated, well, the saturated zone soils down to the bedrock. So imagine that trench, if you're looking at a cross section, you know, if this was the contamination Groundwater is flowing this way, and we want to put the trench that would intersect this, like right in there, you know, to stop it from going into the pond. And that, I mean, I was kind of thinking out of the box a little bit because some folks would just say, let's do use groundwater extraction wells. But I don't think that that, based upon the permeability of the soils, the variability in that, I think the trench intercepting it is probably the best way to stop that piece of it. Okay. Um, other questions? John, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll come back. Uh, yeah, Jack Caldwell. Go ahead. 
I'll come back to John. Hey, thank you. Uh, Jack Caldwell. Um, Bill, you mentioned something about a permanent monitoring wells. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit more about, about that? I, I get the feeling that something permanent means that this problem is going to go way. No. Well, so monitoring wells allows us to have a reference point. So basically, if you look at a cross section of a monitoring well, you know, from the surface, you know, you got the PVC pipe, you got an elevation, those temporary groundwater samples. They didn't survey any of those in. We don't have any elevation data. I mean, I guess they could have done temporary thing, but they're supposed to be temporary. We're going to be pulling them out here, you know. So what the, the, the monitoring wells allows you to get a, a good groundwater elevation. So they'll take the top of casing, they'll get the elevation of that, and then they measure down to the depth to the water. That gives us our ground. So we got those groundwater elevation points. And then that allows us to figure out which way groundwater is flowing, you know, because it flows from high to low, right? So these permanent wells aren't going to be necessary once the problem's cleaned up. Yeah, no, we'll abandon all that once we're done. Okay. Yeah, these are here to help us. Well, so when we put these remedies interim actions in place, we're going to use permanent monitoring wells to monitor the effectiveness. Is it is the groundwater concentrations going down? Are we removing mass? Um, you know, you'll be able to determine that from the influent, just like the surface water, you know, they got influent, they get 400 parts per trillion coming in. So in the trench, we'll see what's coming in to that influent and treat it. But hopefully, you know, we're reducing the mass that's actually going into rec pond. And then also addressing two of the outfalls that are discharging into rec pond that are getting groundwater infiltration. I want to clarify one thing that Bill said, and then uh, Lieutenant Carl Thomas, and then I, I think we have a question over here. One thing that Bill said, and I just want to clarify because I'm married to a geologist. When he says abandon a well, it doesn't mean walk away and leave a hole in the ground that like some baby's going to fall down. <laughs> you know, abandoning a well is a, is a technical term for how they shut down and close a well and they they fill it in. So I just want to clarify because I because I do public involvement, I hate when they use that term. No offense, Bill. <laughs> Uh, Lieutenant Carl Thomas, and and then over to you, John. But I, I just wanted to clarify. I mean, as part of the circle process, the final part, right, the the, the part that we hope to be in sometime soon, is monitoring. Right. Right. So, like after the after the after the the solution, the final solution. But I'm not talking about the interim actions, but the final solution is put in place. The, the U.S. government isn't just going to walk and be like, "All right, well, that's done. Take our word for it." No, we're we're going to monitor. We're going to we're going to continue to to sample data for decades to ensure that that it is contained. And there, that's that's the trust part that I get a little concerned about. If if you need to monitor for decades, why you know is is the threat going to be around decades? Well, we don't know. It's an emerging contaminant. A lot of new technology coming out. Um, just like any other, I mean, we're monitoring a landfill that they capped and put there, and that's going on, you know, 30 some plus years. So the idea is, you know, as part of the circular process, we do the RI, we do the feasibility study that looks at permanent stuff. We do these interim actions. Interim actions can actually become permanent solutions, not intended to. It's a, kind of like that quick strike. Let's get at that contaminant mass that we know is there. But then when we when we get all the data, we do the feasibility study, we work with uh, DEC and the health department, we look at you know, all their rules and regulations and what our cleanup standards are gonna be. Then they do a proposed plan, which basically says, hey, based upon these health risks, these equal, you know, whatever it all is, they look at all that and then they come up with remedies for soil, sediment, surface water, and where we have you know, risk that's above you know, EPA, DEC standards. And then they, they develop remedies to address those. And the more, more public comment periods, because you get to do a 30-day comment period on a proposed plan. And then you also get to do one on a record of decision. But then we take those records of decision and then we execute them. We program and execute you know, what the final remedy is. There could be more remediation out there related to you know, stuff with maybe doing something with sediment in the pond or there's a whole variety of things. We're, we're just doing these interim actions is, like I said, a quick strike and this by no means the final remedy. But once we do implement the remedy, they're supposed to be protective of human health and, you know, DEC, we're all health department, we're all on board and. They may not be a quick, you know, pump and treat systems aren't quick, but 
you know, whatever we got to do to remove the mass. And that's why we're doing all this data collection to find out if there's places where we can do soil excavation to get PFAS contamination out that's continuing to contribute to groundwater contamination. We'll do that, but we're not there yet. Okay, Almost. we're going to move on. John Clark has a question and then I do want to move on to the next um, presentation so we can keep moving forward. Just as a reminder, I think there may have been some public questions online. Um, if there are folks in. From the public who have questions online, please type them into chat and we will address those during the public question part of the meeting. John, go ahead. So, um, John Clark, I can't um, help but think of the PFAS fingerprinting project and maybe out of just not understanding how does that affect um, how far we go with these actions? How does that affect, um, you know, is that in some way an attempt to? limit or, or change the what we treat down to you know no. is it is it assi trying to assign blame to some other source nope it's trying to find out well one what you know it, if it is a source of you know air guard versus you know any of, there's other sources out there but the other part of it is the background part there's anthropogenic stuff you got there's studies out there with rainfall it's in it's in our rain it's in our you know so what's what's the background look like, you know, a mile away from the base that has, you know, there was no A triple F used, you know, a mile right. away. But if it's present there, it's something that just has to be considered in when we're looking at this, especially with all these low levels, you know, the EPA RSLs, the regional screening levels are really low. So, you know, if we're characterizing to an RSL, let's say, you know, the new EPA MCL is four parts per trillion. But in your background, away from a mile away from where you used AFFF, you got PFAS in the soil at, you know, 100 parts per trillion for, because of background, whether it's rainfall or whatever. I mean, that's why they're doing the study. They're trying to, and they're doing it at like seven different bases across the nation. It's not just. Is it part, is that study a part of this process or is it a side as a separate extra, learning it's exercise? A, it's, it's, a, it's a Air Force project. To try to find out, they're trying to collect information on, you know, background levels that they're seeing. So it's it's, well, it's not part of our. It is. Thing. We're 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 part of our we're part of the data set that they're we're one of at. the bases. They're looking at other bases as well, but right. they chose Stewart. The Air Guard's got one in uh, Iowa. We got here here in Stewart. We're selected for it. Then there's a uh, five other active duty Air Force bases. So it has the potential to change what yeah. we do here. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it basically informs what you're looking at as far as, uh, you know, especially with the background piece, that, that's what's really important. So okay. you, right, we have two you. more questions and then I'm, we have Mike and we have Jennifer and then I want to move on. So Mike was first and then we'll come to you, Jennifer. Yeah, hey, Mike Shea, just on this note, uh, could you just clarify what the RSL is for groundwater? I know I see, you know, you guys said that you're going to continue stepping out until you stop seeing exceedances of that. I was just curious about that. And then the second part was uh, you just clarified you know, you're aiming to complete phase two during the fall. Like when do you anticipate us seeing a summary of the data from phase two, mobilization two? Yeah, as soon as the, well, I'll answer the, so once we get all the data collected, you know, there's a lag time because it's about a month in the lab and data validation mm -hmm. and that. So I'll, I'll give you a hypothetical. Let's say if we co completed all of our field work, one September, the trailing end of that data, you know, it'd be 30 some days before we get it all validated. Then these guys got to crunch it and come up, but they're, they're not just waiting for, I mean, they're always looking at the data that's coming in. They're always, you know, trying to think kind of war game plan what the, what the next steps are. What are we seeing here? And then when they actually, then they'll formalize it and we'll do another technical project planning session with DEC and the health department. And then we'll propose, you know, that's where we propose, here's what we want to do. Here's our next quap addendum, and here's the sampling rationale, the DQOs, the data quality objectives. Here's why we're doing this, and here's where we're going to put the wells. And then they take their feedback, and then we're back out in the field again, just like we did, you know, the spring. with the So, Bill, that feed. data, though, is not issued to the RAB at the end of each MOBE. It goes into the next quap addendum, right? But, yes. But then it all will be in the RI at the end. So, the, spe the specific... Like we present it to you in these in these maps, but we're not sending out data packages. Yeah, the, but will we will we see summary maps in the fall or maybe? Yeah, 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 fall. Fall. 
Yep. Okay. Yep. And the other question was about the RSL for groundwater. Yeah, RSLs. I think there's like seven of them, aren't there, right now? Eight. And so those are kind of driving, you know, what we delineate to. And one that we're waiting on right now is DOD has to come up with their policy on how to address, you know, the, the drink, the MCLs for PFAS and those compounds. Uh, but right now we're, we, we delineate to what those RSLs because they're screening levels. So, I mean, that's, but that's where that background thing plays, you know, if stuff that's in the backgrounds above the RSLs, then do we need to be going out that further? You know, out to that that lower standard versus here's what we're saying in that background. But either way, we're going to characterize the site. So, Jennifer, go ahead. Hi, Jennifer Olson. I just wanted to point out because um, what, what you're how you're speaking kind of concerns me. I understand. You know, for decades, you know, PFAS wasn't even monitored or regulated, and you know, we went from very high levels of accept that were acceptable to now lower. And when um, you stated, you know, a mile out, it's testing at 100 parts per trillion. That's a lot. So I understand from a standpoint from like 2002, that's not a lot, but it is. Sci we're, we're, you know, science is catching up, regulations are catching up. And so I think we need to respect to understand the impact these chemicals have on us and the environment. And so um, please keep that in mind when you're speaking. Four parts per trillion, yes, for, you know, folks, it's, it's the lowest it's ever been. But if you're going to blink, you know, just casually go over 100 parts per trillion, that that's extremely high to me and concerning. So um, I wouldn't ever consider that like a background reading. I don't, you know, I'm I just use that as an example. Right. I'm just saying, but this is our meeting, and our public will hear it and think, oh, then it's not that bad. Um, that's a high level, and so I think we need to um, respect and understand that part, please. I Thank appreciate you. that comment, Jennifer, and we'll take that into consideration in the future. Thank you. Um, are there any RAB questions online? Okay, with that, Bill, if you'd go hand your mic to Doug, or Doug, do you want to use the table mic? Okay, um, all right, we'll move on to um, the interim stormwater treatment system presentation. Uh, good evening, everyone. Doug Close with Bristol Environmental Solutions. Uh, we're here to update on the quarter two for 2024. Next slide, please. Uh, if you look at the right side of the chart, the quarter added another 37 million gallons of uh, water treated. Uh, that adds to the total since we set up the plant in July of 2020. We're now at 583 million gallons. Uh, this quarter, April, May, and June, we saw a, a much better effort uh, in capturing drawdown. Uh, we reported 56% of the days during that period, uh, we were below the weir. Uh, much better improvement from quarter one when we saw a lot of weather, a lot of precipitation. Um, uh, so we were, uh, we were happy with those results. Um, the media and the period, as you remember, our batches of media or media life cycle will overlap into the quarters. Uh, we replaced some underperforming resin at the end of March. Um, that resin um, ran through this quarter and into July, and we'll look at it in another slide. Uh, but it performed very well, uh, as we expected, with single digit. Uh, uh, mitigation of the PFOS and PFOA. Um, however, as in normal cases, our media life cycle or our batch usually expires or is taken offline due to the seasonal effects coming from the pond, whether it's loading of solids uh, from turbidity in the water or bioorganisms. Um, this is really what cripples our uh, our process speed and the ability to treat water uh, above 250 GPM. So uh, those effects uh, made us schedule and execute a media change in July. And I'll give you the dates in the next slide. Uh, first, we'll look at the results again, starting in April and going through the month of June. If you look at the left hand column, that's your influent average. If you just look at the bars, you had a couple days right around 400 uh, and some very low ones around 150, 180. 
with an overall quarterly average of 308 parts per trillion of POFS and PFOA coming into the pond. And then after our, you know, treatment of GAC GAC resin, you can see, and again, notice the scale, smaller scale parts per trillion on the left. Our high was 2.5 parts per trillion, primarily PFOS on June 11th. Um, the average for the quarter below a half of part per trillion. So good treatment considering what we know is up above us in the RI findings and what comes into the pond on a daily basis. Uh, we're getting the treatment system to perform um, pretty well. Next slide, please. So the media change was uh, July 9th through 18th. We just finished it. Um, we also completed a complete repurposing, change out, maintenance, a, a pretty big effort this time around. We changed out all the sands, both coarse and fine. We stripped all the vessels. We take out the filters. We pressure wash everything. We also uh, spent an additional week uh, moving into our preventative maintenance activities. We monitor and inspect the vessels um, on a regular basis, especially during every media change. We'd been tracking some corrosion in some of the GAC vessels uh, from, from the carbon. Uh, so we replaced out all of train B, and I'll show you on the schematic as part of our long-term uh, maintenance uh, program. And part of that, uh, we took an opportunity to put an additional intermediate sample port in our resin vessel. So when we go and change out all of our vessels, we'll be putting this additional mid intermediate sample port in our resin. The resin is really the final polish. So we want to, you know, get as much data and, and understanding on how the resin is performing through the whole height, width, volume of the resin uh, and its vessel. So you'll have an influent coming in. You'll have an intermediate, which is set up right in the center of the tank inside, and then you'll have an effluent after treatment. So more data. It's going to help us, uh, you know, predict the life of the resin. The resin in this case ran about 15 weeks. The carbon ran about 21 weeks. Uh, but again, as I stated, it was the solids and the back pressure that uh, happens to the system in all our filtration and then eventually into our media where we can't uh, develop enough throughput to treat water over 200 gallons a minute. Next slide, please. Part of uh, our effort to get better at the pre-filtration, we've been, um, We've been provided an opportunity with a new bag filtration system. It's been out there. We haven't used it, uh, but we've got our hands on some pilot equipment. It showed up late last week. I'm going to be out on the site helping putting it together this month. Um, it's a very similar to those folks that have been out on the tour, and you can see a picture of it there in the uh, corner of the screen. It's a bag filter uh, where the flow comes through just like it would in our uh, mechanical ones, but this has an air sparging system. So when it's calibrated and it's running and operating, we'll be able to shoot compressed air into this system while it's taking water and knock those solids loose in sort of a backwash, if you will from the bag filter. So we won't have to stop the system to change out bag filters. It can increase the flow of water. It'll keep our process speed and our treatment flow at a high rate if something like this were to work and we could use a more mechan you know, a more uh, technical approach to the bag filters than just putting them in the vessels that you've seen out on the system and just waiting for them to clog which is like every day, sometimes two or three times a day. This can be more like our sand vessels where it could be automated and we could operate, use the bags over and over. It eliminates 
well, not eliminates, reduces your waste disposal stream. I think that's a big, you know, it's a big issue for this group. It's always been a big issue for us. So we'd be knocking down the, uh, the amount of bag filters that go into a landfill. And I don't have a lot of other results yet or or information from other sites, but we're excited to get that into the system. We're going to be piloting this piece of equipment through the fall, and we'll probably start having you know results in August, so in October. I think that'll probably be part of my poster board presentation is how this thing really works, how it did in those couple months, and we'll be able to give you a good explanation. Uh, next slide. So just to back up, you know, our long-term preventative maintenance, uh, I just highlighted train B, you know, just to remind everybody, a train is two GAC vessels and a resin. So there's four trains. So we'll rotate through and we'll change out all, all uh, 12 of the vessels uh, over the next six months. And um, we'll put in the new equipment. We'll, we'll monitor the resin a little bit more effectively and see what that data tells us as well. I think that's it. Okay, questions from the RAB for Doug? I saw Ed Lawson's hand shoot up. So I just, um, some members of the public have been concerned about not when the system works well, it seems to work well when it works well, um, but when it fails, so when it fails, that, that number of 308, that's what's coming over into. Yes. And so the question is that what and can we do anything? Because it sounds like a system is working well when it works, but what can we do? Um, that's my first part of the question. What can we do to prevent the failing? I know it's about rain events, but we're going to continue to get Rain events. I mean, I have a follow up question. Uh, well, to address it, you know, we've been, if, if I can, Bill, we've been trying to work in lockstep with all the other actions. We've all been holding our breath for 17K. If we can reduce some of the flow, if we can divert water that our system can't handle, um, you know, I, there's not a system out there that's going to handle 100,000 gallons a minute over a two hour period. So you'll have, but there, there is a, a way to get better. I mean, you have to expand the pond depth. We need a more column of water to have a pump and treat system effectively work because we're bringing up too much sediment and solids. So that's, that's part of it. You need, you know, more speed, more treatment, bigger sizing. And we talk about it every week, every day. What are we gonna do? It, we have it in place, but we're we're trying to work with the other actions. It's just a timing thing. Just to follow up too, and, and as part of the analysis and assessment, are nature, natural based solutions a part of the calculus? Um, things that can clean the water um, using nature based solutions is that part of also the calculus? It, yes, is a simple question. We looked at and did uh, some piloting early on in 2021 uh, with some natural products. We didn't get the results. The one thing that I didn't make mention of in my presentation, but it is an ongoing effective tool, is our ultrasonic equipment. Our uh, electrical um, pulse from the ultrasonic equipment is killing the algae in the pond without chemical without anything else other than just the electrical pulse, it destroys that algae. That's helped us immensely over the last year and a half we've been running it. Um, so much where we, we don't even think, we have, a, we have the ability to put in a biocontrol chemical called parasitic acid, and we've moved away from that for about a year now. So we could monitor to see if it had any effect on our resin, and we like, the way the system operates without it. So we're, we're still shelving that. We don't want to put chemicals into the system and maybe have to backwash it back into the pond. So 
that's the one thing that we we've had success on is the ultrasonic equipment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mr. Lawson. Um, Bill, you wanted to add something, and then Jennifer. Yeah. So, you know, he he mentioned you know 17k bypass reducing the volume, but these interim actions, taking care of the stormwater, the two stormwater lines, and then preventing the groundwater contamination from migrating into Red Pond is also going to help reduce the contaminant loading that's in the pond. So you can, we we hope to maybe see some decrease. So their influence maybe not. 400 parts per trillion, maybe it's down to, you know, 200, 100, because we're reducing that load to rec pond. So though all those things combined, volume, you know, by bypass, uh, groundwater, preventing the groundwater, contaminated groundwater from migrating into the pond, and then also fixing those two primary stormwater lines that are, you know, taking on in Groundwater infiltration with PFAS contamination. And if we can reduce what's actually going, all, all those things combined can actually make to reduce what's actually going. So when it goes over the weir, if we can't do it, it's at a lower concentration than maybe the 400 that we're seeing. You know, but you know to dewater the pond and all that. That's you know, like he said, you know, we can't treat 100,000 gallons per minute you know, to <laughs> you know. So it's just not there. But. Thanks, Bill. Jennifer, your question? So I understand you were stating that you treat 200 gallons per minute currently. Is that correct? No, we have 500 gallons. 500 gallons per minute. Okay. Um, it's a lot of, you know, we've been looking at all of this over and over again, and I think pictures really show a lot, you know, the reality. And, you know, I took this picture when we were on our tour. And this was after a rainstorm that was um, less than an inch. I think it was 0.8 inches of rainfall. And what we don't really see unless you're there is that the area that's filtered is this very small little basin here. That's what goes in, out into nature. And then over here, we were witnessing at the time 1,800 gallons of unfiltered contaminated water going into nature. And so I think, you know, we also have to look at doing simultaneous actions, which is not just look at filtering, but, you know, you're talking about we were actually puzzled because we thought all along that those issues had been addressed or, or investigated, like why not do two things at once? And instead we were told at the tour that you took the filtering approach only. And, and we're seeing now that, you know, it wasn't a good one. Um, but this, this says a lot, 1800 gallons per minute for less than an inch of rain. And I just want to stress that, you know, once it's over that, that edge, it, it's, it's, it's making your work a lot harder and the municipalities that it runs through. Um, and so even 500 gallons being treated, if, if 1800 is going over the weir is that's a huge discrepancy. And that, that's why we have to do other measures. And so if we're not addressing the mass on the base and the mass, you know, in the stormwater, that that's part of the equation. I mean, it's yeah, I respect that except that since even before 2020 at our very first meeting, there's documentation of the public voicing this concern, which was the breaching. And so we're four years in, um, we're now being told DOT is gonna go back to looking at things from 2021 and we're being told things won't even be able to be put to, you know, in action until possibly 2026. We're eight years in, and I know you're asking for our patience, but it's been a long time and it just seems to be, it's a great science project, you know, um, but I, I really need to stress that interim measures really are meant not to be the final solution. And I feel like there's a lot of lengthy expansion on, on the weight gain <clears throat> to get things moving. It's, you know, eight years is a long time. And um, like I said, for four years, the public has, specifically been voicing this concern. So just going to put that on the record. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, other questions from the RAB or any RAB questions online? Uh, go ahead, Chuck. Um, there you go. Chuck Thomas, a uh, couple of questions are related. Um, we've been asking repeatedly for what the real flow is from 17K been asking this for about a year now. And at one point we were told it was maybe 20, up to 20% of the water flowing into, through the base into the rec pond was an estimate that they gave us. 
but we've really been asking what that amount really is because um, it's going to make a huge difference as, as we've all all spoken about do we have any word from dot as to what they actually have? Did anybody put a flow meter on that gauge and on that divert you know on that diversion and see what's going through there yep that's part of the information that they've been collecting you know looking at these courses of action so they have it i can't cite it to you right now i think it makes a big difference what's coming in direct pond and flowing out over the weir but it all depends on the course of action that they select if they do one versus another there's different volumes related to it depending well yeah but the, the volume coming into the base is still going to be st static i mean depending on the rainflow obviously like i said that dot will have to tell us when they brief their coas so they won't tell you what the volume actually is you know Hey, Chuck, uh, Mike Ottinger. So we've looked at some, we have put flow meters on there and we have checked it for different storms and it can be as little as 20 or as much as 40%, depending on if it's a slow rain or if it's like, a, you know, we get an inch in an hour, um, depending on how fast that rainfall goes, you know, because now that's collecting from along 17K. So that's collecting other storm uh, systems other streams and then all those will eventually funnel into 17k so days after a storm for a uh, long you know slow storm will be a lot more water uh, towards the pond so maybe up towards that 40 percent where if it's a flash flood you know everything collects really quick off the road it goes right into uh, the 17k ditches and goes right to the pond so that would be more on the 20 percent side okay thanks mike i think that helps um I'm still saying that the DOT must know the volume if they're planning on putting in a, a, a basin somewhere that's going to hold 30 million gallons or whatever I read in here. Uh, they must know what this volume is going to be. I just feel like it's going to make a big difference because what, what's happening right now is from your own study, we're still with the treatment we're getting, you're still getting 4.7 parts per trillion. Coming out of the F, coming the effluent after treatment. Is that correct? 0.47. I thought you said 4.7. Okay, so so we're way under that. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. One other thing that we had asked for in April was the plume uh, contour map. Yeah, we just showed it to you: a yellow version and a blue version on two of the slides. That's what you got. Those, yep. ground, those groundwater contours on those on those maps. Remember that? I think we were asking about that plume map, and you were the one that brought it up. Is that the map that you were expecting? Yeah, yeah. That that's the state of the plume map right now. It's based on the data that has been collected so far. So that was presented um, in the the maps that Thanks, Walter was showing. Yep. I didn't know if there was more detail. Yes, Walter. Yeah, I mean, we'll continue to improve on it as we generate more data to put into sure. it. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other? Yes, Jen. Touch it and then it's not here. Um, could we actually, could, would it be possible to get this map blown up as like, a full page, just like in a PDF. Probably, but I mean, like, okay, including in like a one, like it on one page of its own, twice as big as this. For I have really, really bad eyes. I look very young, very bad eyes. Um, is there like a one page, like a version where it's on one page, and then I can make it really, really big for my really, really bad little eyes and print it? Okay. I totally, totally get that because it would be helpful for, yeah, I have a small computer screen too. So it would just be helpful if this could be like one page landscape orientation, I think would, would do a lot potentially for some, um, for some among us. I think I just like, I want to echo Ed's question a little bit um, and kind of expand upon that. There are ways that volumes of water entering a treatment system can be slowed down or or held temporarily um and so just thinking about how flashy storms have been how flashy storms are 
seeing the devastation that some of these storms have had, like quite literally on even bigger infrastructure on the base than this specific project. Um, I just want to express like Clearwater's sharing in the community's plea to just like time, timely innovation. Like we know what climate change is doing and we've been seeing it. We've seen it this year um, and we've seen the pressures that it has put on the system. And so I just make a plea for action and not like being like, oh yeah, this went wrong and here's the data, but thinking about how we can actually be preventing these things. I understand that things take a lot of time and bureaucracy and building large things with the military, but like we sent a person to the moon, we'll probably do it again. Like, I think we can figure out how to slow down and reduce the amount of water that's going over this weir. Thanks, Jen. Other questions? Okay, so we'll move on to uh, any RAB questions online. Okay, so we'll move on to the public question portion of the meeting. Is anyone in the public um, here in the room have any questions that you've been patiently holding? Uh, do you remember what your question was from an hour ago? Um, okay, and Johanna, do you have questions online? Um, I'm going to give you a microphone to read them out. Um, so the first question that came in, we have some new folks online. Um, if someone could give a short description of what the 17K project will do. The 17K Convergence is a Meyer Restoration Program Manager, Stuart says. Now it's on. I was using my command voice. Um, so, uh, 17K project was basically designed to divert the flow of stormwater coming onto the base and then discharging into Rec Pond. And that, that's the intent of it. So, because it was adding volume to Rec Pond, the DOT and working with the Air Guard agreed through a cooperative agreement to do this diversion project. Yes, we have a couple. Um, we're going to continue with those and then we're going to get to RAB business because it's 708 and I don't want to skip the RAB business part of the meeting. Um, I believe this one came yeah. in during um, Walt's presentation. It says, Therefore, stormwater will not be sampled within Beaver Dam Lake, only the north tributary, question mark. I'll leave that one for you, Walt. <laughs> and again, in the MODNA, M-O-O-D-N-A? No. MODNA, okay, thank you. Yes, after flowing out of BD, from BDO. Could, yeah. after navigate that, could you repeat the question again? Yeah, that's one. Okay, so the question was, therefore, stormwater will not be sampled within Beaver Dam Lake only on the north tributary. It's Beaver Dam Lake. It's not stormwater. Uh, that, yeah, this is uh, not for, uh, this is Walt Howard. This is, yeah, it's not a stormwater sample. We're talking about surface water sampling. Uh, at Beaver Dam Lake, um, we're resampling the two locations uh, that we did sample in mobilization one. Those are the red triangles. Uh, one, uh, no, hold on, Bill. One at the northern end of the, the lake and one at the southern end of the lake. Those are the same two locations we sampled in mobilization one. We haven't done the sampling yet, is what I was getting to. And then we're doing additional sampling downstream from Beaver Dam Lake. I think in line with that also, can you explain dry event, wet event, and how will it match previous stormwater sampling events? 
It is. It's fine. Uh, so it's all in the storm sample. Yeah, the stormwater sampling is all on the base. It hasn't been conducted yet, but we're we're sampling pretty much all the same locations that we did in mobilization one. Um, there's a couple locations that we're adding uh, because there's a, uh, a few locations that we originally intended to sample that are are inaccessible. So we're we're swapping those out. But uh, all the you know all of them are uh, locations are either on the base or just off the base on airport property. Doing wet and dry sampling events. Uh, yes, we've already conducted the dry and we're waiting to do the wet. Okay, so then we have um, someone online, Shannon Roback wants to ask a question. So Shannon, in case we typed in, oh, okay. the public doesn't, um, for the sake of time. Okay, Shannon, if you could type in your question, I'm just, I'm going in order of the ones that we received. I'll go to the next one. Um, and then we'll come back to yours once you finger, type it in. So if there's any way I could not type, that would be awesome. Oh, I don't see that. Is that oh. okay? She, she has a type. broken finger, so she can't type it in. Okay, all right, this will be an exception. Um, no, I no, I, I trust you, and that's fine. It's just for the sake of the time of time, which is why we set up this process. But I understand she's got a broken finger, so yes, we'll go ahead and call on her. Thanks. Yeah, and I want the rab business to get to it. Um, so just very quickly, um, one thing I know that the rab had asked some technical questions about the fingerprinting study, and uh, they were told that those would be answered today. But I I don't think probably there's anyone there who could answer them. Um, so I'm, I'm just following up on that. Like, for example, um, how will you determine the difference between PFOS that are there due to atmospheric condition, uh, at, or atmospheric deposition versus, um, on base sources and, um, in the fingerprinting study, how will the software determine potential sources when multiple fingerprints from multiple sources may be present in one sample? For example, if a sample contains PFOA from two different sources with varying concentrations, how would the software differentiate those? So I guess I, if someone thinks they can answer them, that would be great. If not, I think the RAB still needs a written response to those. That's the first question. And then the second question is, um, what is the furthest off base that groundwater is being sampled in mobilization two? Because there's quite a lot of surface water sampled off base, but what's the furthest off base groundwater will be sampled since that will be migrating as well? Um, thanks. Uh, some of these questions I know were um, submitted in writing in April, and we have um, been compiling um, written responses to those questions that are in writing, and they'll be in this transcript package, but I can go ahead or the transcript package from April, and but I can go ahead and send out those um, written questions and responses um, as well. Um, and Megan Dooley uh, was the specialist who um, weighed in on those responses. Uh, this is Bill Meyer, Restoration Program Manager. In addition to the, uh, the written, we did respond to the written questions, but they also, DEC's commenting on the UFP QAP and you know we're going to provide the UFB quap to the to the group, so you'll be able to see those data quality objectives and how they're doing the background study and all that. That's all outlined in the UFP quap addendum for the PFAS fingerprinting and background study. So yeah. did get the folks that wrote it to respond to those written questions, and you'll also get a copy of the UFP quap addendum, so you can dive into it in detail. And then also feel free to engage, you know, with Justin star at DEC on it because he's reviewing it and commenting on it as well. Okay, Thanks. there's two more questions. I think they'll be quick. They're from the same person. Go ahead. So, Doug, I think this goes to you. Um, can you produce a graph with influent PFAS to weather events, such as rainfall is what he's talking about. Um, and the influent concentrations, is the influent concentration, does it decrease or increase with rain events? Uh, yes and no, we don't, we, we, we sample weekly. So if we get lucky and the storm event is always on a Tuesday, we'll have great data, but we have done graph samples and we've seen both. We, we, we thought we'd see a dilution 
of uh, PFAS totals with big rainfalls, and we have, and, I, and maybe I can work on this graph. It'll be limited data, but we've seen it both ways. We've seen high concentrations during a rain event, but there is some dilution with, with steady rains with a lot of water running, fast water coming through. So I'll make a note to see if I can do something like that. Um, the second question is, have you considered a foam fractionation system up front of the system? This technology can remove significant PFAS at high flow rates, which would then have your filters last longer. I, I can say we're looking at foam fractionation. Um, the, the guard is looking at it. The DOD is looking at it. All the consultants are. It's a new emerging technology. It, it shows a lot of promise. Um, you know, we, we like it. We haven't, you know, we haven't talked about deploying it or anything. Yeah, and this uh, Bill Meyer restoration program manager. Uh, one of my other projects at Biddle, the company Alonia is actually doing a uh, 6 month pilot on foam fractionation using our groundwater extraction wells up there. So, I mean, we're looking at it. It's just a matter of, you know, is it, is it appropriate to incorporate, you know, into the surface water treatment, you know, with the concentrations and that. So I, I, uh, this is Colonel Thomas. I, I, I'd like to, I'd like to, um, just piggyback off of that. Cause I was, I was at Biddle, uh, last month and I had an opportunity to, to check out that, that setup that uh, Alonia has. It is very exciting. It's it, and, and what. What was just suggested online was actually uh, what, what they're doing at Biddle is, is groundwater. What was suggested online was to use use it as, as sort of a, a pre treatment in the, in the surface water system uh, and then use use the 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 GAC GAC resin as finishing. Um, and and, and th there are there are proposals, uh, you know, sort of along those lines. But I'll just say that the Alonia project is, is a demonstration scale, right? We're talking 10, 10 gallons per minute. Right? Uh, and it's it's being led by the defense innovation unit, right? So so it's 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 it's, it's a research project, right? It's re, RDT and E research development technology funding. So so you know the the tech is is there. It's 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 getting proven. Uh, it's very interesting to scale it up to this this model. Yet you know we we are trying to you know we're trying interim actions to to, to get after the problem now. Uh, and and so and so it, it is exciting. It's definitely something that, 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 that we are considering and that I'm pretty excited about. I mean, but I'm just, I'm just an engineer. So. Thanks, Colonel Thomas. Any other questions from the public online? Okay, we're going to move on to the rad business part of the meeting. Um, it is 718, which is less time than we had allotted for this amount. Um, so I don't know how quickly we can move through, through things or if you want to stay a little bit long. I don't want to stay more than maybe 15 minutes long. Um, so we're going to move on. We'll kind of roll, but if we really want to have some good discussion, um, we could stop and decide if we're staying a little longer. The first thing on the agenda is the base tour. And I don't know if any of the folks who were on the tour wanted to speak to it. Um, otherwise, Mike Ottinger will, but I think Mike Shade, you said you might. So. Hey, yeah, uh, well. You know, I know that I appreciated the tour. I think other folks that joined the tour very much appreciated it as well. Uh, you know, as Jen noted, it was really uh, powerful to see the water flowing over the weir, you know, in the event of a major rain event. And, you know, I think it really, you know, brings home the point that many of us have been raising, you know, that we need more uh, solutions to address ongoing offsite contamination because every time it rains, even a little bit, we know that. Uh, PFAS contamination is spreading throughout the watershed and eventually making its way into the Hudson River and undoubtedly uh, contaminating fish that people eat. So uh, really excited that we're, you know, looking at interim measures, but we really need, I think, to move as quickly as we can, because I think just seeing that really demonstrates the urgency of the challenges that we face. Uh, for me, that was my second tour that I've been on and it'd be, it was pretty similar to the first tour that we did about two years prior. I don't know if we'd be able to see other parts of the base where uh, AFFF was historically used and likely uh, discharged. You know, it'd be interesting to see some of the sources of contamination. It'd also be interesting to look at the lagoon a little bit more. 
And I also know that myself and other members of the RAB appreciated the opportunity to speak to, I'm going to pronounce his name incorrectly, so I apologize, Colonel Daneman. Daneman? Yes. Uh, and I know we had an interesting conversation around health concerns that community members face, which is obviously a real issue for folks that have worked on the base, especially folks that worked with AFFF. And I think members of the RAB would appreciate further dialogue with the Colonel to discuss some of these issues, because I think there's a lot of mutual interest. Uh, so we'd welcome the opportunity to meet with the Colonel again to discuss issues that we're talking about today. Having that face to face dialogue was really valuable. Thanks for that input, Mike. Um, Mike, do you have any? Okay. All right, we're going to move on to the next slide, which I actually got these two slides backwards, but I figured you'll forgive me. The next slide tells you what we're going to talk about in the RAB business. And look, we're already done with the base tour. Um, we're going to talk about the Science Advisory Committee because um, there was a discussion about um, with Mr. Lawson about um, renewing that. It existed a few years ago and has sort of fallen by the wayside. So we'll talk about what the process is for that. He wanted to talk about the TAP grant, and I, I know Mr. Lawson had to leave early, and I don't have anything more to tell you about the TAP grant. I don't know if any other RAB members here do. And if you don't, then we'll be moving on past that topic. Um, so if anybody knows what the status of that is, we'll talk about that in a minute. We'll talk about the fall poster board session, and just a reminder to send RAB-related messages both to public affairs. That's a general public affairs email address, so if somebody's out on vacation, there are more than one people that um, that pick that up, and and um, Mike is actually in public affairs. Mike is a public affairs officer now, so um, just so you know, one of your PAOs is here at the meeting, and then also send those messages to me. And I typically, just so you're aware, if you send me an email about the RAB, I forward it to both co-chairs so that they all are aware of what's happening as well, and also to to Bill as the remedial project manager. So just so you know, if I get a RAB-related email. That's that's what I do with it. Um, so next slide, please. So uh, this is in the um, operating procedures. What you may be wondering what the science advisory subcommittee is and and how you might reinvigorate it. It, it this is um, straight out of the operating procedures. Um, it's a subcommittee of the RAB, but not of RAB members. It's a way to tap three non RAB members from the local community who have some technical expertise. So it's basically kind of an official way to get some free public advice from your um, from your technical, you know, liaisons in the community, um, folks who have the technical qualifications and scientific expertise to assist the RAB in understanding, obviously, what are very complex issues. Um, those non RAB members um, should submit a resume to the community co chair. And if the community co chair and other RAB members believe that individual is qualified, they will forward that resume to the installation co chair um, for concurrence. And then once approved, those three RAB, those non RAB members who make up the science subcommittee um, can review science related documents that are made available to the RAB, but that may not yet be available to the public. Now, there hasn't been a plethora of these types of documents. It's not that you've been missing out because there's been a lot of documents that um, have been available to you. The QAP is made available to you, um, and this is a type of situation where um, somebody on the science advisory subcommittee could review a QAP um, and weigh in on your behalf to help you understand that as a technical document. Um, so. Basically, the next step is um, for you all to reach out to people that you think would be um, good people to be on the science advisory committee and have them submit resumes to Mr. Lawson. And then he and you will review those resumes and decide if there are three of them you would like to have serve as your science advisory committee. And those resumes would then get forward to Lieutenant Colonel McGuire. And if you need a refresher on that, I pulled that all out of the operating procedures. Um, Chuck Thomas, go ahead. Uh, Chuck Thomas, a quick question. Um, Jen, maybe you can help with this too. I believe Shannon Roebuck had submitted her qualifications to Mr. Lawson to be included on the uh, on the science committee, and she works for Riverkeeper or Cena Hudson. Riverkeeper, get my get my. Okay, um, so, uh, you know, I would like to motion that we add. Because I don't want to wait another 3 months that we add Shannon Roebuck 
to the science committee. Now, I don't know if he sent her qualifications along to you, but I know she's online right now. And could she send them along to whoever needs to see them uh, at this point? So I wasn't, I haven't heard that before. Um, I, and I wasn't aware of that. Um, the process would be for you as RAB members, and it can be a We've got you know a fair number of RAB members here. It can be you know nods of heads if you're all in agreement, um, but then it would be a matter of Mr. Lawson forwarding her resume to um, Lieutenant Colonel McGuire, um, and and you could have two others as well. But you could start with one. Be great, anybody? Yes. <laughs> yeah, this is we don't have worry about Robert's rules. Uh, you know, if you you know, is there anybody of you know? I'm getting thumbs up from around the table. Yeah, okay, so we'll reach out to Mr. Lawson um, to ask for her resume. Maybe if she's online, maybe you could forward that to Mr. Lawson and copy me. Um, and my email address is there in the presentation. Um, and then we can get that get that moving along. Thank you. She said, okay. She said, okay, great. All right. Thank you, Shannon. Appreciate that. No, Colonel McGuire, it's, he has to concur. That's as per the operating procedures. The co-chairs work as co-chairs. They both make decisions. So, no, 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 I just want to be clear. I just want to be clear that, um, right. So the next step is for it to go to Colonel McGuire. And, and also, frankly, because Mr. Lawson's not here, presumably he's would also be nodding his head, but we should give him an opportunity to, to, to say that by email as well. So we'll, I will follow up with Mr. Lawson and Lieutenant Colonel McGuire to um, to get some input on that and make a decision. Um, next slide. And I think this is about um, touching base on the TAP grant again, okay. and I don't know the application status. So if okay. there's a uh, mic, you. you raise your hand. <clears throat> Yeah, we have the application filled out. We have all the materials. I thought it was actually communicated to you guys because yeah. we wanted to vote on moving forward with it uh, because we've discussed it internally. We have a draft. We have uh, some scientists at the University of Albany that have agreed to serve as uh, experts. And you know, we were interested in moving forward to vote on that tonight, but perhaps there was some miscommunication because I was understood that. I was, I thought, uh, either Dan or Ed had forwarded that to you guys to get this on the agenda. Okay, this Bill Meyer restoration program manager. So the process is you got to work with uh, Lieutenant Colonel. Tom McGuire, he's the co chair. Co chair has to put that in a memorandum and sign it saying I support this proposal for a tap grant, blah, 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 blah. So you may have internally put together what you want to do, but you got to talk it between the co-chairs. They need to come up with the yes, we all agree. This is within the you know the what tap grants can be used for, and then it goes out under Lieutenant Colonel McGuire's letterhead saying I approve you know the the following activities, and then what we'll do is we get the uh, get the fund we do the contracting for it. So if you guys want to use you know professors in that. We went through the base contracting. That's what we did at Barnes. Base contracting reached out. They provided a scope of work and a you know a cost estimate. Here's the tasks that we want you to look at. We want new these guys to review, you know, Integra ECAs or action memorandums or UFP QAPs or whatever you all want them to look at and provide you that. It's like your third party, just like Novelis is the Air Force's yeah. third party. It's your third party. So, so can I just make a motion right now that we approve the submission of a tap? Well, as, as the RAB. Um, then, what you need to do because we haven't. What you I know from having worked with Barnes on theirs, um, and they did theirs by email. So I haven't seen like your like your proposal. You yeah, need to have that pro question that was brought to you. If the email with Dan was what was the process we were ready to go. So if we if we can okay. for the sake of time, just follow up with that. 
so that sure can... sure we can follow up with that the bottom line is you need to it, it can be done by email uh, email of what the proposal is sent out to the RAM members you you write back say yes I approve this then those emails can be attached, but there has to be that proof that there's a majority of, of the RAB that approves that application. Thank you. Point Jen. A point of order. I just have a question about the process. Is okay. That... I don't know. Yeah. It just needs to be closer to my face. Okay, so to clarify what the process steps are, does the RAB have to vote to approve the TAP application before it is sent to Yes, Colonel McGuire. Yes. Okay, but we're not allowed to vote on that right now because nobody's presenting the proposal tonight. Okay. Well, that's kind of what we're trying to do. Yeah. We've had it all through the emails. We've all seen it. The proposal. We know the qualifications of the individual from Albany. We've already reviewed it internally. We had a call okay. two weeks ago. Yeah. Victoria has wants to weigh in on this. Sorry, can you hear me? Okay, I'm gonna talk, but you'll stop me if you can't hear me. Um, so my understanding was the same that we would the community needs to vote on the tap application, agree uh, upon it, and the community members here, I believe, sorry, have all seen the tap application, and we can perhaps verify that before we do a vote. Um, once we have that vote, then um, it's my understanding that the next process step would be sending it up to um, the colonel, the co-chair, so that we can get the official application um, moving forward so that it could be eventually sent for approval um, higher up. So we just, we were hoping to get that first step done and I thought that was communicated um, and I, I don't see any impediment to voting, at least from the community member side, as long as we verify that everyone voting has seen the seen the package. Is that okay, correct? is there one person here who could simply summarize what you're voting on before we vote right now? Can you summarize yeah, what your TAP grant, the purpose of your TAP grant is? Yeah, I think I'll pass it to Shannon would have the uh, best qualifications for summarizing yeah. that. Yeah, that's, I'm happy to do that. So I can just read um, if it's helpful from the actual application. So hang on just one second and let me pull it up. Okay, so um, there, uh, a professor has been identified at SUNY Albany. It's Yana Liang. She's the head of the uh, sustainable and sustainable environmental engineering department at SUNY Albany. She's a PFAS um, expert. Um, and the goal of the project is to, um, you know, given the complexity and the volume of the work, um, have additional expertise and time in order to be under in order for the RAB to be fully informed and understand what's currently underway and what is being proposed um, in terms of the proposed remediation and work plan, um, so that um, you know it's it would be an assessment of the cleanup technologies, the current data available that's being provided, the technologies that are being proposed. Um, essentially, it's a second set of eyes to um, look over the proposed remediation and to hopefully be able to provide um, some some translation for the RAB because a lot of this work is very technical. So, uh, a description of the project is remo reviewing site remedial plans and data collected to date and technologies that are selected um, to investigate or clean up sites at the installation and uh, interpretation and analysis from Dr. Liang. Um, also asking her to survey and interpret existing literature and data relevant to the cleanup plans, peer reviewed publications, and summarizing that uh, to both the RAB and also uh, she's able to present findings at RAB meetings um, uh, as needed. Okay, thank you. Sorry. 
Okay, and um, Mike Shade was nice enough to pull his laptop over to me too, and um, I have a copy. I can see the application in front of me. Okay, so based on that summary, um, I would like a show of hands from community RAB members um, that you would like to submit this application. Okay, and just like uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. She does count on the internet, and she also votes yes. So that's eight RAB members. Um, who have voted that they would like to submit this application as is, and are there any RAP members who do not agree? Okay. Um, so the next step then would be for the RAB. It typically is the co-chair, but he can assign that to somebody else. So if anybody else is taking the lead on this, um, then the RAB can go ahead and submit that application and it goes to Lieutenant Colonel McGuire. There may be some back and forth about questions or clarification of the scope, um, but that's something that happens. And, and this is where um, it, it does go to, into a base contracting kind of situation. So I, do, I, I only know that from what I've seen at Barnes, um, where they have successfully completed one tap and have a second one in the process. All right. Yeah, this is Bill Meyer, Restoration Program Manager. I helped develop the PWS and that for Barnes. I just happened to switch the project over to Chris after he got the TAP grant approved. So, yeah. so I'll basically translate your requirement. I'll identify the documents in that that are upcoming for this year for this TAP grant and then put it in a scope of work. And what they basically do is they, the, what happened with the, uh, just to give you a sense of what they did at Barnes, they uh, did a contract with the, the university so the, the folks that were reviewing the documents were basically, they reviewed the documents and then they provided like a, a technical memorandum to the RAB saying, you know, we reviewed this and this is the following findings that we had. And then they even had in the scope to do, to the do a presentation to the RAB of the findings of what it is. So we'll identify upcoming documents in that. So like Antikra Ica, that I talked about the non time critical removal action engineering evaluation cost analysis. That'll be a draft document that. You know, could be included as part of the tap grant another UFP quap addendum for the 3rd phase. You know, once we're done with phase 2, also a look at the phase 2 data, you know, all that. Th those things can all be incorporated into that, but it all will require, you know. The, these advisors to the to the RAB, you know, to do a technical memorandum on what they found and what their recommendations are, it has to be a product and a deliverable. It's not just here we're going to pay you to go look at something, and it's not an oral history of what they found. It's got to be you know written and a deliverable, but it's super easy. Okay, thanks, Bill. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I was just going to say that I, I have the application here. I could forward it to the full RAB just to hopefully move the process forward, especially since Ed had left. That would be great. Dan, Dan was supposed to send it on behalf of Ed a couple weeks ago, and maybe I know he went on vacation, so maybe that slipped through the cracks. Yeah, that's okay. Okay. Yep. Great. So I'll forward that to the group right now. Okay. Thank you. Um, so touching base at 739. We're nine minutes over. Um, the last two things really to talk about um, were the, the, um, the requests that we had um, from a member of the public um, to move the public, the, the public questions part of the um, format to the beginning of the meeting. And then we also wanted to talk about fall poster board planning, not in a great amount of detail, but to, um, to touch base on some, some general things so we can start planning for that. Um, so first thing on the on moving the public questions. Um, first of all, I want you to know that it is in the operating procedures that questions are asked at the end of the meeting. So changing that will require a change to the operating procedures. I can tell you, I wasn't involved in preparing these operating procedures, but I work um, on a number of RABs, um, and they they all have public comments at the end of the meeting. And the reason why is because it it's meant to be questions on the presentations that happen during the meeting, the same way you all ask questions um, immediately following each presentation. The public question portion of the meeting is meant to be questions on what has been presented, as opposed to statements made at the beginning of a meeting, more like maybe a city council meeting or something like that. So, so that's the rationale. I know at least behind 
setting it up that way for the RABs that I, where I've been involved in working on the operating procedures. The other thing that is in the current operating procedures is that there would be 20 minutes at the end, and I know we have cut back on that. I never, I wasn't aware. I, I it, it, you know, I didn't, as I prepare the agendas, I didn't have in my mind that there's supposed to be 20 minutes. And we haven't always had people here that are asking those questions. So over time, we've gotten, I've gotten slack on maintaining that time. And so that is something that both um, Lieutenant Colonel McGuire and Ed Lawson felt that at a, at a minimum, we need to make sure that there is 20 minutes available um, for the public to ask questions either online or in the room if they have those questions. So we, we need to not just shove it to the end of the meeting and there's, oops, there's five minutes, you know. Um, and I, I take that on as, as facilitator. Um, so discussion about um, whether you want to move um, public questions to the beginning of the meeting or some other way to handle that. We don't do it after each um, presentation the way we do for RAB questions, simply so we can keep things moving around and get through all of our presentations. But um, I, I you know, want to hear your input on this and whether you want to make a change in the way um, uh, this is handled in meetings. It's Jack Caldwell. Um, part of the, my thinking on this is that the people who um, come to, to these meetings may not be here for the purpose of listening to the reports. They have something to say and they have something to ask that uh, waiting two hours or more to, to do that is, is adds to their frustration. The, um, the opportunity to be able to speak um, is, for me, is, it, it's more welcoming to the community. And the point here is the community is what was affected by this, and they need to say something, and they need to have that opportunity to say it without adding to their frustration of a long, long meeting. The things that are reported here may not be the things that they want to talk about. They don't, they're not here to listen to the meeting reports and then respond to those reports. They're here for a, a bigger purpose, the, what's going on in a, in a larger sense. The thousands of people were affected by this and they would like something to say about it, an okay. opportunity to say about it. Um, the, the last meeting back in April when we had a little bit of a disruption there, that was a good example of somebody very frustrated by by something that happened that no one expected. It was the, that flooding of the of the lake and all of that kind of stuff. That was not something that anybody was going to report on. Right. Let me ask you a question related to that because the public does not necessarily know the mission of this board, which is only related to the environmental restoration program for the base. And we're restricted by by the, the RAB rule legally. I mean, you know, that's written into the law. So it can't be, I will have to shut them off if they come to speak their mind about issues that are, now this particular issue is side related. It's, it's related, it's not related. It's, so I'm not saying that the particular issue that's come up is, is somewhat related. Um, but if somebody comes to complain or make a statement about something else, I would have to stop them because they're not, because it's not part of the mission of the RAB. So I want to make sure that you're aware of that. If, if we choose to make a change, I want to make sure that you're aware of that constraint is that this board is not um, allowed to talk about things that are not related to the environmental cleanup of the, of the base. Yeah. I, I... I do understand that, and there's a risk in allowing people to speak up front uh, where they could redirect the purpose of, of the day. They, they could disrupt the day it's, or the evening and, and um, not serve any purpose here at all except just to complain about something. Okay. Uh, oh, I understand that risk. Okay. But, I, but I do feel that, that the community should be allowed to at least take that opportunity to, to speak rather than waiting to the end. 
Um, if it's a risky attempt, maybe maybe it's, it'll be worth it. I, I, I'm not sure what will happen, and I don't know how often it will happen. Right. And um, it's, it, it just seems to me to be a response to the community um, that says, yeah, we're here for you. We're, we want to, uh, to include you. Okay. Um, Jennifer? Um, I want to point out that in the four years that we've had this, these meetings, these forums, um, I guess the last meeting had a little disruption, but overall they haven't been. Um, and I think the purpose can be, you know, illustrated or, you know, you can address it just like you do all the opening remarks to remind the, the audience. But um, I think the big thing here is it's a public meeting for a reason. I think given that these only happen four times a year, our community deserves the right to be able to speak. And um, I just, I find it interesting only because I'll always go back to that first meeting where there was a discussion about if there wasn't enough um, response that they, the RAB would be dissolved. And I just kind of feel like there's this apprehension to actually have it be successful. And sometimes success can be messy because you know it's a an enlarged community that's been gravely affected financially, health-wise, emotionally, everything in between. And unfortunately, you are on the other side of it because it was sourced from your base. So I think that's something that you have to deal with internally as well. Yes, these meetings have a purpose and we can always be reminded of it. Sometimes I wonder why I'm here. Seriously, because I mean, I can only hear about filters. I, I love you, Doug, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> I went to art school, so, and that was a great experience. I'm, I'm not into filters, you know, past my Brita, although I probably should get more up to date on it because, you know, with life and all. Okay. Um, I, I think it's important to give our community opportunity. It's been a struggle to keep them engaged. Mm -hmm. It's a very, you know, and that's part of your plan is community engagement. Well, that involves having the community be able to engage. And it might not be in the strictest way that you guys are used to. We're not military. We're not, you know, so I, I think we should go ahead and try it and see what happens. And, and then we can learn, you know, okay. along the way. Anybody but I, I, I just want to stress one other thing. We're constantly rushed. We're constantly rushed. And yet our questions maybe are a third of what is being then spoken to us. And sometimes, Bill, no offense, it took a heck of a long time for you to just tell us the timeline for, the, you know, will we be notified for a 30 day comment period? And that could have been down to 45 seconds. So when these meetings go over, it's not necessarily on our part. Oh, I agree. And so I'm, I'm just want to state because it's my turn right now. Um, and now to look at ways to shorten the community speaking. I, I just I, I, I want to clarify. Want to I am not looking at a way to shorten. But the you are speaking. cutting off. Right no, 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 no. The request was to move. But the in period, the, not to shorten it. If I can finish. By doing that, it also ensures they have that time to speak. Okay. That's what I wanted to say. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we were not looking to short. Then you see, I'm at I'm I'm on the path and we get cut off. What does that mean for the rest of our community if you're saying you're apprehensive to them being able to speak? I, I just I, I that needs to be brought right there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I was not trying to cut you off. I was just trying to clarify that I was not looking to cut down on the amount of time that the public has to speak. Other comments from other RAB members, Jen? I do think that that is a direct dynamic that Jen named, and I would welcome you instead of saying that you didn't mean to interrupt her, like you did in fact cut her off and speak over her when if you had waited 30 more seconds, it would have been a different dynamic in the room. And like, I understand that it's hard to talk about this kind of stuff and that it's like 749, it's almost 8 p.m. Like we all feel really rushed during these meetings. We wanna get through everything, but like I think giving our, everyone here, I need to do it better too, is like if we can just all give each other a little grace, a little space would be good. Um, I also do think, Amy, like if someone comes here with something and it's not something that this body can weigh in on, like that's helpful information for them, you know? Cause like they just might not know where to go. Like they might not know that, it's peripheral or unrelated and like they might be mad and we might have to hear some and feel some of that anger, but like have being able to clarify who they could go to could be really a positive opportunity to like 
build a better dynamic with a frustrated individual, even if we can't necessarily like give them the answers that they're looking for. Being able to hear them and like redirect them to the person that could be like is valuable. Okay, thanks, Jen. Anybody else? Um, go ahead. Tyler Conway. To uh, support what my fellow RAP members are saying, the issue is the disenfranch disenfranchisement the uh, community feels, the apathy the community feels from engaging institutions. It feels like the institutions do not care. And so when you've mentioned you might have to cut someone off for being disrupted, disruptive, the fact is the situation has disrupted thousands of people. And you may not have meant to come off a certain way, but it's, it is hard to stand on this side and feel like your voice matters. So at minimum, if people talk all night about how this has impacted them, their babies, um, their future, there has to be some type of care from this institution. That is always gonna be the problem in our community. It's just Newburgh or it's just this area. It's not just, it's people. And I said this before, I don't know if I, I don't know where I said it, but the military will not leave any soldier behind. Military should not leave no community behind that is impacted. So if people, and again, I understand you're going by the law, you're being objective in your relaying of information and the passion that is felt is really just the history, it's historical pain, essentially. So to shift the, the public speaking point to the beginning so people can feel engaged or just feel heard, because half the time people don't feel heard, right? That's really, can, can we be heard? So it does make sense if somehow, for more community engagement means a lot more community voices are allowed to be utilized um, and felt. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so um, is there a proposal from some, I think we probably still want to have an opportunity for the public to ask questions at the end on the presentations they've heard. Um, so should we try having a period at the beginning of the meeting for, hey, is there anyone here from the public who has, you know, you, here's a copy of the agenda, you see what's on the agenda, is there someone here from the public that has um, something they'd like to bring to our attention or concern or some comment, and we have five or ten minutes at the beginning of the meeting and another ten, fifteen minutes at the end of the meeting, does that, I'm seeing some nods, I'm open to other recommendations from you. Yeah, I'd recommend 15 minutes at the beginning and 15 at the end. 15, 15 at the beginning and 15 and I, at the I end. Think we have to actually have to figure out that this meeting is going to take longer than what we've been scheduling so far. It's going to happen. Because yeah. we got great presentations, we got great, great questions about them uh, that need to be answered. Yeah, yeah, I agree. The meeting just feels too rushed. And more projects. <laughs> like we, it's like we can't really. Okay. There's not enough time for even us as members to ask questions. Right, and this this meeting is going two and a half, and this is not the first time by any means. Um, okay, um, I'll take this for consideration back to uh, Mr. Lawson and Lieutenant Colonel McGuire as um, your proposal. It will require a change of the operating procedures, which is not a big deal. I just want to let you know, um, but I'll relay this back to the co-chairs. Um, Can I ask one more question real quick? Yes, sir. Was Jacobs reappointed or rehired to do us for a year? That's a great question. I don't know yet. You don't know yet? I, I don't know whether I'll be here in October. Here so, no, the, the decision has not been announced yet. Bill told me today it's probably in the next couple of weeks. Um, so, um, it's, you know, they're still deliberating based on the cost proposals. Um, so that I don't know, hard. which I had, I had hoped that I would know when I was here, whether I will see you in October or not. And I actually don't know. Um, and I, you'll probably see me online if we're because <laughs> at least for the first meeting. 
Um, but let's talk about the fall poster board planning and, and I, I, just I may or may not be involved, but I want, um, there were some comments back in the fall and during the course of um, the year since we'd had the poster board session. And one of the big ones was that the whole amount of time was a lot, having the poster board session and then followed by the RAB meeting. It was a very long period of time. So the, um, the planning team has sort of bounced this around and come up with a couple ideas. Um, and we wanted to throw them out to you and then also hear your ideas on that. And, and maybe one of them is we, we liked how we did it and we want to do it that way again. Another um, option would be to have the poster board session on one night and the RAB meeting like the next night. So people could come to one or the other or both based on what they are interested in. Um, there was a proposal to have the fall poster board session be in person and have a RAB meeting online like we used to have um, maybe a week later. Um, so you still get the presentations and the maybe more in-depth questions, um, but it's spaced out like that. Another one would be to replace the regular presentation part of the fall meeting with a poster board session. So, so instead of the presentations and the group questions like we're having now, the fall meeting would be a poster board session and the other three quarterly RAB meetings would be the same as they are now. Those are sort of the options that the team has, um, you know, talked about, but we will, and, and, you know, so we wanted to see what thoughts you all may have on that, or you have other, other options, or maybe you like it the way it was. Jennifer. My only concern with removing October as a, an a official RAB meeting would be, we do have, so, we were anticipating DOT presenting at that point, correct? And there I don't know there. that we have a schedule from them. I haven't heard a schedule from them. Have you Mike? I think any more with the recent development of, um, you know, kind of the snag they had. So I think they're kind of starting over or starting from up farther. We've had a very hard time nailing them down on when they might. Um, it's not from lack of Mike and others asking them, but it, they're, they have their, their own process that, that we can't control. So we don't have an answer on that. I guess my only concern would be it would then be extending six months before the next official meeting to go over things, ask questions, and have that things on record. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there needs to be some form of a, of a RAB meeting. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to Jack Caldwell. I'd like to do that, agree with Jen on that. Um, but I'd like to talk a little about the actual poster uh, presentations. Um, I'm thinking along the lines of a, a structure of some sort where, where the community, this is a great opportunity to engage the community. And it's one of those opportunities that we've done maybe only once before. And to do that, for me, I'm thinking somehow the community needs to participate in it before it actually happens. In other words, uh, the posters may respond to a series of questions that they come up with, the community comes up with. Um, it may be a theme that belongs to the community that they give to you guys and posters get created that address that theme. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what those things are yet. We need to, uh, to pursue that and get it, get it out to you so that you can get time to do your posters. But um, <laughs> if, if the posters are done about where you are at the moment, there's this four year disconnect that would happen. They, they haven't been sitting in the audience like we have been sitting in the audience and, and following your presentations over the years. Um, so so I, I, I would rather see some other kind of postering that is that is uh, more related to where they are and what they're feeling and what their questions may be. Um, anyway, that's that's the thought. Uh, there's another structure here that I that I am thinking about. When somebody walks through that door, um, posters are all over the place. In in my mind, where would I begin? I don't know where to go first. The, the one that's way out there, or the one nearest to me, and so on. I'm, I'm thinking that that there need, should be some sort of an order set up where there's a, a first one and a second one, and it comes to a conclusion of some sort, um, where there's a, a, 
it makes sense. A logical progression okay. of postering. I agree. So, something that, that is. Makes, Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, that is something the, the progression is something we tried to do in the fall and may or may not have hit the target on that. And we um, um, tried to have somebody at the sign in table introducing people to the flow. But again, we may not have fully hit the target on that. And I know that we didn't fully hit the target on. Um, because I got feedback from you all then at the meeting and later that um, while there was an attempt to make the posters more of a higher level, bigger picture. Um, I suspect that they were probably still too technical in this and that's, you know, there's more room to go there. Not saying that people don't want some of the technical information, but we need to meet people. I think what you're saying is meet people where they are now and and answer the questions that they um, have now. Other comments? Yeah, hey, uh, my comment is I, I agree with what Jen was saying about, you know, there being value for having a normal RAB meeting. It also seems like having a poster session and a RAB meeting in one night is a lot because even just holding a normal RAB meeting is long. So I would vote my suggestion would be to have two meetings, normal RAB meeting and a poster session and either they're back to back a day apart or maybe as you noted, one is online, one is in person. I don't have a strong feeling either way. I mean, I would personally prefer for them not to be back to back in space at least 2 weeks apart. For my own personal interests, but, you know, I understand if folks are traveling from out of town, that may not be possible, which means maybe. Doing it online, maybe is worth considering. Because I, I just think for a lot of people 2 nights back to back can be challenging. Okay, other comments. Jen, I agree. I. I really appreciate that. Thought is being put into that of like, how can we not overwhelm people? I think that that's like, I appreciate that a lot. Um, I don't think that we should eliminate the regular meeting. I agree that ideally not doing it back to back nights would be great. Um, and then the other, I just had a question relating to what, um, what Jack said, is there a best way that um, ideas on the poster session, like, can be submitted to the planning team. Is that just through, um, like, Dan and Ed sending it to you, Amy, or is there some other way? Because I think, like, we could expand a little bit upon what Jack said as a rab, but we shouldn't do that now. We if we can just email it to you and not uh, stay incredibly late. My personal response is, I would encourage. So, so your role as RAB members is, to, as you all know, and I know you already do, is to act as community liaisons with all the people that you know in the community. And my recommendation would be to talk up the poster board session more with people and ask them, and you know, everybody you talk to, ask them what would they, what are, what questions do they have, what do they want to know, um, and start a running list that you email to the co-chairs and to us we have, by a certain date. Is there a certain date that you would have in mind for that? Well, there's the subcommittee as well that you haven't brought up, which is. Right. Well, the committee. other thing, that's right. And last year we formed a subcommittee. Um, I think there were three or four people on it who reviewed the posters, um, the planning part of it. Um, Probably didn't start as I know the the advertisement and the planning part of it probably didn't start quite as soon as people might have liked. Um, this one is going to be a little tricky because there is that contract change in the middle of it. Our Jacobs contract ends in September, and we are not scoped to support a fall our poster board meeting. That doesn't mean I'm not going to discuss it in our you know our internal meetings. But there's a limit on how much I'm allowed to work on it um, between now and September. And then you, if it's me, great. If it's you know Jacobs, but it could be a new contractor coming on board. So I don't know what that will do to it. So with the with the if there is a transition, it's Amy's not just going to disappear and go. Oh, I'm done. She'll be transitioning for if if they don't get the contract, they'll be working with the incoming contractor. They're going to do a, a left seat, right seat. You know. Here's what we're doing. Here's our processes. Here's the RAB. Here's what's coming up. I mean, they're not just going to go <laughs> peace out. I'm dropping. <laughs> they're, they're going to, they're going to do a transition and. You know, so we're going to find out here, you know, hopefully. 
That's right, and and that's as some of you were on the RAB from the very beginning, and and when um, Heather Pfeiffer was the facilitator, and it's the same thing that happened at that point in time, and Heather was phenomenal in in helping me get up to speed before we took over, um, and she's probably online, so thanks, Heather. Um, <laughs> Jen, so just to close the loop on that, we'll just put the, like we have a lot of those ideas compiled. We'll just have um, Dan and uh, Ed to send them to you soon, and then you'll. You'll confirm receipt and then we'll see where the chips fall in the next couple of weeks. And then if something happens, I mean, it sounds like there will be transition time. So sending it to you is appropriate and mm -hmm. you can help the new person understand. Yeah, I would say let's, I mean, pick a date in mid August, like the 15th or something like that. That's a couple, a couple weeks from now. Um, to start to pull together these, keep in mind that these are the, the big picture questions that people who have not been coming here all the time want to know um, so that we can maybe do a better job tailoring the posters to them. And I'm hearing that we do want to go ahead with a regular RAB meeting in person or online, probably not, well, it sounds like definitely not the same night and probably not back to back. So um, we'll take that back to the team and discuss it so more. When's the next planning meeting? Because the co-chairs get together and they talk about what the agenda is going to be and all that. They just did one for this. It's normally a couple months before we do it. So we got enough advanced planning time. So you guys will still be on contract before. That's true. That's true. And we haven't set the. Um, date for the um, co-chair um, agenda planning meeting yet, um, but that would also be in August. And Jennifer, you brought up that um, that third bullet, the subcommittee. We So as I was saying, we did have a subcommittee of people who reviewed the posters, but perhaps um, the subcommittee that the RAB forms could be more involved in helping. Um, well, it's up to you what you want that, that committee, subcommittee to do, but be more involved in helping us um, tailor what the posters will be, not just reviewing them, but here's what the topics ought to be. Um, maybe more, you know, how we're going to get the word out about the poster board session, all of those kinds of things. So that would be something where the RAB should choose um, three or four people to serve on that subcommittee. <laughs> we'll call I second that nomination. Jack called you guys can figure that out by email. <laughs> Jen. Um, and then I did just want this, this relates to the fall poster board planning session. Um, the, I understand that I think we were maybe in government shutdown territory last October. Is that why everything was so delayed? But there was like a lot of delay in terms of getting um, the meeting promoted and getting the date set and all of those things. And it seems like there are some good steps being taken to prevent that from happening now. Um, however, I do just like want to raise the agendas have not been circulated two weeks ahead, despite um, both the operating procedures of this body that have also been referenced back to us um, earlier in this meeting. Um, and so I would really, I would really, really appreciate if um, we could really try to get the agendas out as per um, the operating procedures. Um, and also that is something that keeps coming up in these conversations and just like also out of respect and care for this community, giving people the space to review an agenda is really valuable. Um, and so the sooner we can, we can nail down date time, all of those details before there's any potential transition would be very beneficial to us. And then just making sure that agendas come out in a timely way, but having the subcommittee be more involved, super f fantastic. It would just be great to get these other pieces also aligned um, with that as well. Okay, thank you. I take responsibility for that. I think this one went out um, on Friday instead of Wednesday, two weeks ago. Chuck? <laughs> Try Kyle, Try Kyle. Oh, there we go. No, oh, Jen has a magic touch. <laughs> Thank you, um, Chuck Thomas. I uh, hope we can get the date scheduled for the poster board session because it's huge that we get started a month early to get that information out. I know that was one of the comments that we had among ourselves. Uh, we need the time to get that out and try to get it on social media, you know, and the location. I know it's tough to pin it all down, but uh, I think it's necessary. Okay. Thank you. 
All right. Anything else? Oh, the other thing there was um, we did have a number of outside presenters. Um, uh, EPA had, I think DEP had some posters. Um, the city had some posters. Um, do you want to continue with having other presenters like that as well? I see Mike nodding. For every, for everyone, we we ask them. We ask them to come. You can ask them to come too. <laughs> That was the University of Albany to talk about the health study they're doing. Okay. okay. Um, so we're going to move. I'm going to move on. There's probably still more talking here to do, but I encourage you to start um, collecting those ideas of things and we'll I'll touch base with uh, Mr. Lawson about the post report session as well. These are the dates for the upcoming RAB meetings. So make sure those are all on your calendar. Um, I don't see any reason that those dates would be changing with whoever is running the RAB. So, um, with the possible exception of the fall meeting, that might be the poster board date and the RAB meeting may be, you know, so that's still to be determined, I guess. Um, but those are the scheduled dates. Um, next slide. Uh, that's, I think that's about it. Keep going. Um, and so, um, are there, that should say October instead of July right there on the top line. Are there any, um, basically, for proposed topics um, moving forward, and, and I think I probably need to update this slide a little bit, but the process is for you all to submit proposed topics um, to Ed Lawson, who will bring them to the, the RAB Agenda Planning meeting with um, Lieutenant Carl McGuire. Um, Follow-on questions, and I want to clarify that follow on questions can be from anybody from the public or RAB members. Um, I think that might have come through in that email that that some this person may have thought they were only for RAB members. Follow on questions um, can be submitted till August 2nd um, and to Dan um, and there's his email address and you all know that. And um, as I said, we did get some follow on questions in April and those typically do go into the transcript package, but um, I'm going to make sure that we also um, email those out to you, which might have been the process a couple of years ago. Honestly, we haven't had any in a while. And so, um, so I will make sure we get those um, written questions out and responses out to you. Next slide, Johanna. Um, okay, so I would put October 23rd on your calendar for something to happen here. <laughs> um, and whether that'll be the post board or the RAB meeting, I don't know yet. Jen? All right. I'm sorry. I have two two final things. I, I really wanted to ask, and I was trying to be respectful of the agenda and let us actually go to the part where we ask questions about things that are not, that are, that is like the discussion. Are we going to do that? Or is go ahead. It, okay. Go, I sort of skipped it. And then, I wanted to know about the process for updating the community in, involvement plan. And then I was also wondering, um, is there a plan to get updates to the administrative record back on track? Because they're yeah. not, and that's actually like incredibly problematic. Right. So the community involvement plan is included in the follow on contract. Um, that's part of the scope of the follow on contract. Um, so once that contract has been awarded, um, that that organization, whether it's Jacobs or somebody else, will be meeting with Bill to schedule when that would get started and presumably making some presentations on how that's going to happen. We're getting information out to you about that. Um, the administrative record is behind and those transcripts are, um, we're working on getting those up to date right now, yes. Um, um, those are being submitted um, to the guard this, this week, the ones that are missing. And I don't know behind the scenes timeline um, for getting them uploaded. So Bill Meyer, restoration program manager. As soon as I get them, I upload them. And then we've got a contractor that takes them and uploads them to BB&E. So I just need the final document. And then I got to actually transfer it to their, their bucket, their folder, and then they upload it. Some of the files are really big. So sometimes they got to break them up into like four parts because there's a size restriction on you know what you can download from AFCAX. So we have that with like the UFP quaps when they're a 700 page document. 
you know, it's, <laughs> it, it has to be busted up because it only, you can only upload so many megabytes at a time. So, but yeah, that's the timeline. So as soon as I get it, I can I can say pretty confidently that they would be up no later than the end of August. I would I would expect, you know, but it doesn't typically take that long once they're submitted. Is there the possibility of like just trying to be a little bit more timely with that, or are yeah. we facing like internal military? No, options? there is. So there is a there. Is, that that's on me. Um, the, Bye. Those have been late. The um, there is a process. It's not an immediate process. What happens is we go. Um, the transcript package includes the English verbatim transcript that Laura's doing here right now. Um, that takes a couple of weeks before it comes to us. It gets reviewed for whether there are any errors, not for changes in what was said, but was anything captured incorrectly. Then we go through an internal process for translating that into Spanish, because that's also part of the translation, uh, the transcript package. And that takes some time, as you might imagine, these transcripts are over 100 pages long. Um, so, and, and then all of that gets compiled and submitted. That final part of it, sometimes the Spanish translation has been a little bit delayed based on somebody's workload in the final compilation part of it, it I take responsibility for. And I apologize, and that will, change should i should i have it'll change with this one because i have to get it in by september um and it will um and should we have the following contract we'll get those out more quickly jen so um, jennifer, i don't jennifer sorry thank you jennifer rosen um the youtube videos are an easier accessible point for the public i doubt people are diving hard into the transcripts um and it's I'm so happy that we've had live translation, but if we could challenge in this next contract to include that somehow, because in other forums, um, to record it, the live translation, so that that could be another avenue for people. Also, on WebEx, it would be they would be able to hear it um, if they wished for a Spanish translation. You know, we have this this. This resource, she left because no one was here, but right. there's a resource that's here and isn't being used to its most optimum level. And so if we can consider that for the future, because again, I think if someone's choosing transcripts versus um, YouTube videos, they're going to choose YouTube. And sure. you're putting all of this issue into, you're saying it takes a long time to translate these 100 page transcripts, but um, we're already, we have someone here doing it and it's not being used. So mm -hmm. please consider that. Okay. One last thing is I wasn't able to make it in April. I don't think that I was here. Sorry. Uh, the meeting before that we had had like a discussion around, um, making some potential changes to, um, the 105th air wings environmental page and adding the meetings like when they are, where they are basically like that stuff um, for future meetings and then putting the agendas up there and linking to the YouTube and doing some of those things. And um, I was just wondering like if we could get a status update on what was deemed possible um, at the next meeting would be really great. Okay, great. I'll, I can work with Mike on that now that he's in public affairs. Chuck? I think we owe it to you and to ourselves to um, come up with an answer about what we want to do with the next meeting and the poster board session, because I don't think that got resolved. Oh, yeah, I'm on. Did I, get, I don't think that got resolved. What I heard was that I was going to take back to the planning team, and but maybe what I can take back is a firm res recommendation from you all. What I was going to take back was we want the poster board session and the RAB meeting to both happen. We want them to not happen the same night and probably not also back to back that they should be separated by a week or two and if they could be both be in person that is preferable i think but if the rap meeting needed to be online because of restrictions on travel that would be acceptable is that um an accurate summary of what i heard i think so yeah i was happy to do it uh an online meeting in a week or so afterwards. Um, that's what I was going to propose. Okay. Um, so, so I know you travel to the next base. 
right after this one sometimes, don't you? I do have um, the Barnes meeting is is back to back. Yes, yeah, the Barnes yeah. meeting is tomorrow night. So um, to respect, you know, your time and travel back and forth uh, or whoever is going to be here in October, which I hope to, um, I'd say let's do it online, the meeting and uh, have the poster session, get it, get the date out, get the advertisement out, try to get people here for it and then do an online meeting. Anybody? Do people check? agree or do people? So, to solidify that as the poster board date and then we, I, I would prefer to, Jennifer speaking, if we can solidify maybe this date as the poster boarding because we are concerned with the community and since we are trying to be flexible about the RAB meeting, that be the to be determined date. Okay, that's, that's my suggestion. I don't know about the rest of us. Here. I see a lot of nodding. Is anybody not agree with having October 23rd be the post report session? Okay, sounds like the, the post report session is October 23 and the exact date of the RAB is to be determined probably within a week or two of this meeting um, and either in person or potentially online to save on um, travel. Can we have a confirmation of the RAB meeting's decision by, like, say, September 5th? Sure. Yeah. Or do we want it sooner than that? It can be sooner than that, I think. I can. Yeah. Okay, so August 30th. Yeah. Okay. We want to know. Before Labor Day. Before Labor Day. Sooner the better. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, with that, I think um, any closing, Mr. Lawson left any closing comments from um, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas. Ed, Ed asked me to. Oh, and from Jennifer. Thanks. Uh, I just want to thank everyone uh, for your dialogue today. Uh, some, some, some really great comments, particularly from Kyle and Jen um, about the, you know, the frustrations and complexities of, of approaching an institution like the military, right? Uh, that really hit home for me today. Um, I'll say, you know, um, you know, we're we're engineers and and, and civil servants, um, and and sometimes our answers are very unsatisfying, right? Um, it's it's funny how different our responses were to the to the to the progress of the interim actions. I was stoked at how fast it's going, and uh, from a community perspective, you're you're pretty disappointed at how 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 long eight years is, and and and, and I think that's 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 telling, right? We we, we come from different worlds. Um, uh, but, uh, we do care and we're here, not just out of duty, but because it's the right thing to do. And, uh, I just wanted to say that, uh, so thank you for being here too with us and we'll keep doing this until we get it right. Thank you. So, um, to piggyback on that, I actually have this, when we went on our tour, I took this picture, which I thought was pretty interesting. It's. A plaque that's inside, so not all of the public gets to see it, and it's actually 82 years old, um, 1942. Well, no, it was issued in 67, but acknowledging in 1942, stating um, "Good Neighbor Award" presented to the by the citizens of the Greater Newburgh area to Stewart Air National Guard Base, in sincere pre, pre appreciation of their interest in community affairs. And so, um, with that, I. You know, I do believe you guys care. I appreciate that you come. I'm sorry if sometimes we're a little bit grumpy, but you know, um, the PFAS has uh, overwhelmed some of our lives here. And, um, you know, we do look forward to looking at steps moving forward, being as proactive and, um, you know, revolutionary in terms of, I, I know you guys look at it as a science project because, you know, we are, the lucky bases to be actually having these interim measures and looking for solutions. But um, so I know it's a long process. Um, they refer to it as a marathon a lot, but I'm not a runner. And um, but I, I do appreciate everyone's presence here and hearing us and hopefully, you know, we can move forward and and get the job done to the best abilities that we can. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, next slide, I think it's just uh, websites. Um, and so with that, I'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. I appreciate you all staying so late. Um, and I think I will um, be bringing up with the planning team too, whether these meetings need to be longer so that we can engage in these discussions. And 
Um, if I'm going to interrupt anybody, I'm going to work on interrupting Bill more if I have more of an opportunity to be here in October. Um, just to, I'm, I'm kidding, but but to help make sure that his responses are, <laughs> but to help um, make sure that responses are more succinct. Um, so I appreciate um, you're all being here. Thank you very much. Please leave your table tents and your name tags. Um, they will be, those will be here in October. Um, and thanks and good night.